Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Emily Abbott. Emily is a former collegiate basketball player and elite CrossFit athlete, and now she is blazing the trail in women's pelvic and sexual health, returning women to epic womanhood structurally, physiologically, emotionally, and spiritually. She is currently pursuing a doctorate in Chinese medicine and acupuncture, as well as practicing hands-on, hands-in work, and womb healing modalities, both online and in person. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and live their dreams. And now over to Paul and Emily, the Bliss Woman. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we are talking to the Bliss Woman. Don't be surprised, guys. You want to hear this. If you want to understand your woman or women in general, better yet, if you want to learn about pussy, I brought the master to you. I learned about Emily Abbott from Nathan Riley, MD, who has a beautiful podcast called Holistic OBGYN. So if you are interested in things, of the female nature or mothering or pregnancy. He's the man. He's our family OBGYN. And he said to me, Paul, you got to interview Emily Abbott. She is incredible. So I did a bunch of research. And not only is she very skilled and knowledgeable about the female body and all things to do with it, including the pelvic floor, but she has been a nationally ranked CrossFit athlete. And she's beautiful. Emily, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Paul. And I love receiving that beautiful introduction. Oh, yeah. Well, you earned it. You know, I <laughs> I went to your website and um, looked around and saw a lot of the... I even searched you on the internet and saw lots of great pictures of you in CrossFit competitions. And, you know, you're definitely the badass woman. There's no question. <laughs> Nothing like a good looking girl with muscles. Oh, I mean, it feels really good to be a strong woman. I have it to say. does, yeah, yeah, yeah. It must <laughs> feels it feels really good to feel a strong woman. I've got a couple of them close by. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to get into all sorts of stuff, um, and I'm excited to talk about these things because a lot of the things you do are very important, and well, all of the, all of the things you do are very important, and I also have uh visited your website where you sell the pleasure tools for women and made a purchase and have referred a client to you who was very impressed with what you do and so i've had plenty of time to check you out (laughs) and uh, i must say your pleasure tools for the ladies are obviously designed by a woman they they really uh they look like art pieces you know they don't just look like stuff you see at a sex shop they look um well thought out artistic in their design mm. and um they even feel unique you know they're they're not to- they're not light and fluffy they're real i don't know i don't know how to describe it they're um heavy hitters they, well they feel like they're valuable i guess you know like yes. some you know, some beautiful stone ones what are they made of the stone ones is that marble um, it's an, all different types of um, crystals, um, amethyst to rose quartz to um, jade, Indian jade, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and then um, stainless steel. And I think that the most valuable um, and most exquisite technology a woman has are her hands in order yes. to experience self pleasure. Um, but once you get into um, deeper states and exploring deeper parts and the subtleties of your vagina. Um, that's when these beautiful tools come into play and they are pieces of art, just like learning how to make love to yourself is an art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I really was impressed. They, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that likes fine things, whether it be good smoke (laughs) or 
good pot or a top-notch stereo or the best weightlifting equipment or even the coolest rocks I can find. So it was just neat to see that you'd put so much thought and work into them. I could tell they were designed by a woman. Mm, yeah. Well, I do wholesale those from a, a woman back in Calgary, and she's really put a lot of thought into those products. And uh, yeah, they're exquisite, as they should be. They're going inside of you. Energetically, they have to be exquisite. Yes. And I think the materials that they're made of lend themselves to inner work, you know, like not mm -hmm. plastic or mm -hmm. some synthetic material. I thought that was a real nice touch. And I think any woman that wants to, you know, more fully enjoy her, herself would also appreciate the uh, quality of, of what you've created there. Emily, you're probably most well known for your ranking as a top female CrossFit athlete and are just, and, and you're just now becoming recognized for your work in women's health as an expert in the pelvic floor and women's sensuality. I mean, I, I'd never heard of you till Nathan told me about you, but I was certainly really impressed with what I found. Could you share a, an overview of your life path and what led you to putting so much effort into CrossFit competitions and then what oriented you toward women's health, the pelvic floor and mastering women's sensuality. And I think that's interesting. I'll preface uh, giving you the mic here by saying that you don't, I think you're the only, what I would call elite female athlete that I know of in the world that has ventured not only deeply into the anatomy, physiology, and functionality of the pelvic girdle, the pelvic floor, but also the sensual side of it. So that's quite a, a rare combination. I think most of the elite female athletes that I've worked with over the years, which has been a lot of them, are quite masculinized. And so they, they seem to need more connection to their feminine on every level. They, they push so hard train so hard and they're often always being trained by male coaches that have so little understanding of the female. Probably the most common, two most common things I've had to work with them with is one, just physical burnout and two, just over masculinizing themselves um, psychologically as well. So I think that you're a rare combination. So I'd love it if you can kind of give everybody listening a bit of a a, a tour through how it is that you made this journey into athletics, what, you know, to be what you were ranked sixth or something in national CrossFit or what was it? Um, I was actually eighth in the world it was my best finish. Oh, eighth in the world. Right. Very good. Yes. Yeah. So that's a very high yeah. level of competition for sure. So what mm. made you want to push yourself that hard? Oh God. That's such a great question. And, um, you know, I grew up on a ranch in Southern Alberta. Uh, my father had been a fighter pilot um, in one iteration of his life. And my parents had really big, powerful, freedom loving energy. And um, the way we, my dad and I connected a lot on the ranch was doing heavy physical labor. So I was lifting, you know, um, heavy oil pipe for fencing from a very young age. And so this really primed me to understand that like by connecting to the earth, by connecting to my body, I was connecting to God. I was connecting to a power very, very much bigger than myself. And so I got into the world of sports and, um, you know, I was, I became this outboard motor of performance and I loved it. And I ended up going into collegiate basketball winning a couple of national championships in Canada for basketball. And, and then, you know, as soon that became my identity. And then I was streamlined into CrossFit because I was like, Oh, I don't want this to stop. I want to continue to perform. I want to continue to be the best at something. I knew that there was more, more juice in the tank. And I was really pursuing now that I look back on it, I was pursuing freedom. I was pursuing power and influence. That's what I wanted. And so mm -hmm. I got deeply entrenched into using my body to create power and influence through, you know, through CrossFit, through having sponsorships, through being really good at the sport, and also pushing my body to unspeakable um, acts of physicality. 
And within that, I became very masculinized. I was in a hyper masculine sport. Um, I, my performance was the most important thing. And my external validation was based off of my performance and, you know, my validity as an athlete. Um, and that was my world. And it was, wasn't until I, I fell in love with a man because I was deeply yearning for, uh, that strong connection with a very strong man. Um, which, uh, I didn't understand that my energy and my denial and suppression of the feminine was actually re repelling anyone that could step up to meeting me where I was at. And it was within that like masculine shield world that I discovered I actually had no ability to, um, discern what was good for me and what wasn't because I had no access to my feelings, my feminine, right? That passive state. And so mm -hmm. I ended up being in a very, I would say an emotionally abusive relationship um, that I was will willingly participating in because I could endure a lot. And um, yeah. I became, <laughs> I could endure a lot, like running through the Arabian desert with a uh, metal plate attached to my chest. You know, I was like, oh, this is great. But um, on the other, that pervaded every arena of my life. And so I ended up becoming pregnant in this relationship. And I knew immediately like that, that this wasn't what I wanted to bring into the world. And I, this wasn't, the safety was not there for me to bring uh, a child into this world. And so I ended up um, having an abortion and I had absolutely no way to self-soothe or to care for myself outside of going to the gym and linearly getting better every day and pushing myself and pushing myself. And so I didn't even rest post-abortion. I had a really hard time with that. And because of that, um, I remember one day my partner touched my partner at the time touched my arm and I couldn't even feel his touch. And I realized like, oh my God, I am I'm numb. Like I can't feel anything. I couldn't feel anything from my eyeballs down. And so it was preseason, you know, it wasn't time to like be training really hard just yet. And so I thought, okay, if I can figure out how to snatch, you know, 200 pounds or clean and jerk 250 pounds, I can figure out how to heal myself um, and like start coming back to this space, which is my womb, my vagina. And and I can learn how to master this. And so began, I began this very slow journey into, uh, yeah, I guess, interfacing with my pussy. And um, which was very uncomfortable initially. Uh, I actually really didn't enjoy that. I didn't, I, I bought a course that I found um, through Layla Martin. And I started, I did my first womb meditation. And I just was like, Oh, this is awful. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to engage with this space. So I went back to the gym, trained my ass off. I won this competition, the, the Western competition, the regionals, and I had new sponsors flowing in. My ego validation was just getting like all the good hits of dopamine. And then t I remember telling my mom, like, wow, mom, like everything's falling into place. That partner I had had just um, proposed to me. Um, I was about to go on a great adventure into more athleticism. I was stoked. Two days later, I get a phone call that I have uh, failed my drug test. And oh, I boy. remember that, you know, that's the worst nightmare for any athlete. Heart dropped into belly. And oh, then began this journey of discovering like, okay, well, like finding a lawyer trying to stop the process of me being like uh, deemed as a cheater and kicked out of the sport that I've just devoted five years of my life to. And, um, and basically what uh, transpired was my partner had been taking a sublingual supplement. He was in the military at the time and passively transferring that to my mouth through via kissing. And I had like 0 0.001 picograms per milliliter, whatever the measurement is. And I think that's like half a grain of sand in a Olympic sized swimming pool. That'll and, do it. <laughs> right. And so, uh, I, 
I got all my documents together. I got all my supplements tested. I did everything I had to do. Um, it was the most stressful time of my life. I think I lost about 10 pounds and, uh, CrossFit did not believe me. They said, Nope, you're a cheater. You've been a cheater. Uh, you're out and that's it. And so immediately like that overnight, everything I, my whole identity that I had built up this house that I had built up of my, of the way I made money, the way I showed up in the world, um, the way I expressed myself was taken away. And so I went up all around. I, what, do, what do you do when that happens? I went traveling. I went around the world. Um, I went to an ashram in India. I went to Jordan, Israel, Petra, um, Australia. And I just walked and I traveled and I walked and just really had to, you know, uh, go on my crusade of unwinding what had just gone on. Sounds like you went on a pilgrimage. I totally went on a pilgrimage. And what's weird is that like, I could get into like, yeah, some even more esoteric things, but I was, you know, what I was really doing was I was learning or I was pinned down. I was being chewed up and spit out by the feminine. She said, no mm. more, honey, you cannot continue to do this to your body and to live in this way and to be in relationships that are destroying you because you are destroying you. So my, my inner shame, guilt, frustration of like not really being truly satisfied in CrossFit was then ripped open and poured out to being uh, mirrored back to me in the situations in my life. And so I remember getting to this ashram in India and being like, well, what am I supposed to do here? I started asking people, like, I just don't get what I'm supposed to be doing here. And they're, they smiled at me and they're like, oh, this is your first time in an ashram. You're supposed to be doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like oh a silly western girl like and that was the first time that I began to unravel and everything that I had been running from all of my feelings the abortion the way I conducted my life um the way I related to others the way I was closed um and was really just con constantly seeking for sources outside of myself for truth um basically all came rushing through and I had to feel everything. Whew. Yeah. And so then I, I was called on this trip to go. I found myself in Peru leading this crew of athletes through uh, the, the trails of um, the Incan trails. And so I got called to do an ayahuasca ceremony. And when I drank that cup, I knew that everything in my life was culminating to this point for me to really understand and to open. And I had my ass kicked. I screamed the woman's scream. Um, Mother Aya turned me into a, a snake. And I knew, uh, she showed me that if I return to my body, if I return to supreme self-love and embodiment, every door of my life, all of my desires will begin to open up. And so that then began my commitment to my pussy. I knew that she was the way. And no matter how uncomfortable it was, I could use all my relentless training as an athlete to pursue this, to understand this, to become the empress of this domain. And uh, yeah, I guess the rest is history. I began training with a um, physical therapist who had gotten a pelvic floor physical therapist who began understanding the emotional connection between symptoms in a woman's body, uh, in a woman's womb. And, uh, and her emotional state or traumas that happened to her. Uh, her name is Tammy Lynn Kent. And then I went on to train with Martin Bedouin and just got, get into this work of gynecological massage, um, understanding my cycle, uh, understanding deeper pleasures. And the more that I interfaced with my pussy, the more my life began to shift into incredible desires that were really coming through. And so that's why I do this work today, because women are in a huge state of disconnection. And Paul, we need, we need them. We need the half of our population to begin stepping up into this integrated epoch that we're heading towards. And it's not about suppressing or overpowering one of the sexes. It's not about fighting against each other. It's about really coming into a co-creational state. And that is done through 
the radical responsibility of a woman becoming the expert or the sexpert, the virtuoso of this beautiful instrument she's been given. It's a gift. And so that is why I do the work that I do. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. Um, you know, it's, it's really a hero's journey story. And, you know, most of the time people talk about the hero's journey in relationship to men. But I think that's because we, we, have, we don't have enough female heroes. And, you know, you, the first part of your journey was really more like the hero's journey classically of a male athlete. Um, and even though we do have great female athletes, most of the female athletes that are famous are typically not strength athletes unless they're a gymnast or maybe an Olympic weightlifter, but most people still think of the male Olympic weightlifters, not the females. So there's a lot of uh, very strong characteristics. But what I find interesting as someone who studies and works with the archetypal realms a lot is that your hero's journey began in the masculine expression of yourself. And then your ordeal, your crisis, was your soul saying you're not going to fulfill your life path this way, nor are you going to fill your heart, nor are you you're going to become a woman. You're going to just keep becoming more and more of a man. Mm -hmm. And um, then meeting the mentor is the people that helped you come back into your body and into ultimately learning the skills that you learned. While you were talking, I wrote a note because you reminded me of a case history that I had, which I'd like to share, especially for the women, because so many men these days are using testosterone creams, testosterone sprays, testosterone supplementation. It's, it's, it's a, another whole disease I should probably do a big podcast on because that's a big trap. Yeah. And it's almost always due to lack of core understanding of how to take care of oneself and how to yes. use weightlifting and everything else properly. But a number of years ago, I had a woman come to me who actually looked very similar to you. She could probably be your sister, interestingly. Hmm. And she was really freaked out. And she had been to lots of doctors and therapists and nobody could figure out what was going on with her. But she began to grow facial hair. Her voice got deep and she said to me, Paul, my clitoris is like growing a lot and I'm freaked out and I'm not doing steroids. I'm not even interested in that. And so she came to me to try to figure out what the hell was going on. And I will pat myself on the back because it didn't take me very long to figure it out. I said, what does your boyfriend do? <laughs> she said, he's a bodybuilder. I said, is he using any kind of testosterone growth hormone or any hormones to enhance his development? She said, well, yes, actually he is. He sprays some kind of testosterone boosting cream on his body. It's a spray thing. And I knew exactly what it was because it was real popular at the time. I said, well, honey, guess what? You sleep with him. And he's spraying that on his body, and it's going into your body. So long story made short, we found out, you know, got the name of it. I had her blood tested. Sure enough, her testosterone levels were sky high. Mm. And so all I had to do was tell her to tell him to quit using that stuff or stop sleeping with him. And then she slowly normalized again. And then um, the other thought that I wanted to share with you that I think is quite interesting. Are you familiar with Hermes? Like the god? Yes. A little. Well, Hermes is the god of liminality. Hmm. The term liminality means a liminal space, but it means to move through a doorway. It's a transition. Hermes is the god of transition. So if you end a marriage, 
in a divorce or you lose your job or someone dies in your family, those are what are called transitional zones. And whenever we're moving from one way of being to another way of being or going from childhood to adulthood or adulthood to old age or death, those are the spaces in which Hermes is the god that gets you through that transition. And I was quite surprised when I researched Hermes and found that Hermes, the name, comes from the word Herm. And when I read the meaning for the word Herm, I about fell out of my chair. It's the capstone on a stack of rocks. Whoa. And I went, holy <laughs> shit, that's wild. But the reason I bring this up is because you found the doorway to your femininity. And the god of that liminal space is Hermes. So I think it might be an interesting investigation for you to look into Hermes in Jungian psychology because he is also Mercurius, which is the magician in tarot. Mm -hmm. And I think that there might be a dimension you can add to your coaching with women because when they can connect to Hermes, it can give people strength to make that transition, whatever it be, from your feminine to your masculine, your masculine to your feminine, from being lost and afraid and confused to being found and whole again. Um, so I just felt compelled to share that with you. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery, but what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. HLC1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1234 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function. How the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental emotional stability and much more. HLC1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. Emily, I feel we're in an epidemic of burned out women, be they mothers, working women, female athletes, or young women and children that are being poisoned by processed foods and environmental chemicals. Um, though I feel we're also suffering the effects of an overdue switch from a patriarchal dominance worldwide to a long overdue um, switch to matriarchal. Uh, I don't know if we need matriarchal dominance, but I, we need to go back to a balanced state which historically I don't think there's much record of a period where the males and females were really in harmony with the exception of a few tribes or a very mm -hmm. occasional culture. You know, there's always a yin yang polarity. Fortunately, there are, you know, some wise women 
coming out and leading the way, such as Kelly Brogan, Christine Northrup. Vandana Shiva, I put in there because she's a woman and she's very, very highly intelligent. And she really, to me, demonstrates the female warrior, but also the queen. She's like a powerful queen that can stand up to the Bill Gateses of the world. And then, of course, you have people like yourself educating men on many levels. I just love to hear your thoughts about where you think we are and what you think the medicine is and maybe why people like you and the ladies I mentioned are starting to step forward in the world now more so than in the past. Oh, I think that's a beautiful question. And uh, I have more to even say on like the doorway, the, the Hermes, the Herm, um, because yeah. the woman's journey, the heroine's journey is very, it's very similar, like the hero's journey, but it is a doorway into the underworld. And actually there's a, the myth of Persephone um, is yes. all about, yes, the woman going into the underworld or the portal, the doorway to her soul through her pussy. And um, that's so important in this time because women are so disconnected from their desires and their feelings. And as a result, um, their pleasure standards are set to a minimum, a bare minimum. And so that means that life force is just trickling through them. And when you're in that state of not living in pleasure, joy, or bliss, or true God connection, um, basically you cannot bring forth your co-creational power, your the being the creatrix of your life. Or as I've heard in your podcast, having that creative agency to paint what you really want. And deep inside right. each woman is a vision, a grand vision that is attuned just to her. And when she starts to get clear on her signal, her inner knowing, that inner feeling, her desire, accessing the great ocean of desire within her, that's when the fun really starts to happen because life force is flowing. It's gushing through her and it's not op only represented, um, you know, with her, with herself sexually, like the, the gushy juiciness she can live in, but that starts to pervade every arena of her life that she yes. can, she can magnetize uh, and also direct, right? It's channeling these two primordial energies of the um, feminine and masculine and all the gradients in between that. And so many women in the pursuit of, because, okay, let's, we are in an incredible time to be a woman. We, the matriarch epoch didn't work, that egalitarian era, or it was a, what we built off of. Now, then we went to kind of this extreme patriarch, which is what we're in now. And you can see that it's getting messier and messier as we start to integrate or move into the integrated epoch where women and men are stepping into the king and the queen role, the true masters of their universe. And this is where we start to build something that is incredible, right? Something that we life wants us to create. We just don't even have a concept of how good it can be. And that's much like pleasure. Just when you think you have it figured out, it takes you down more mind bending journeys. And so in the pursuit of power and freedom, right? Women want freedom for the first time. We're in such a great time to be a woman because we can really go do whatever we want, a lot of us. But many women adopt this hyper-masculine way of being in the world or that masculine wound like I was in, in order to gain the foothold of power and influence. And if you look at modern women, we're killing ourselves by only operating at ha like 50% of our energetic capacity. And I would could even argue the same with men. Um, women, modern woman is having terrible hormonal disruptions. They are plagued with brutal periods. Um, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of cramping. They're plagued with really painful births. Um, and, you know, uterine prolapses and um, ovarian cysts and uh, pa even sometimes painful orgasms. And this doesn't have to be so. It's common, but it's not normal. Right. And so it's a really important time for women to start to understand the frame of reference between what it feels like to operate 
in the masculine, the pure, beautiful masculine, and the pure, beautiful feminine, instead of slipping into the distortions of those two energies. So what would that look like for a woman operating um, in a hyper-masculine paradigm in her life? Um, she may be hyper independent. That means that she feels like she just has to do it all. She has to do it all if she wants it to be done, to be done right. She may have a lot of tightness in her back body, a stiff neck, a painful neck, tight T spine. She might have uh, like a light sweat because she's always in a constant state of stress, a fuzzy tongue, feeling snapped, rigid, closed, shut. She likes to overschedule her life. She loves the thrill of kind of being in a state of stress, like that overwhelm. Uh, she has a lot of inner policing and overstepping of her wants and needs because even uh, we could talk about female athletes do this all the time. You have to overstep your wants and needs in order to get to the top. And so there's this huge disconnect um, and sexual starvation of never being truly satisfied. And uh, again, you'll see that in every arena, every realm of your life when you're living this way. And the, the modern woman's body is being destroyed, Paul, as you can see. There's, there's numbness, there's shutdown, there's going after men that really just don't do it for you or dating men that just are not in alignment with your vision because you don't know what it is. Um, there's a lot of settling. Um, there's a lot of um, reliance on surgeries like ablations, um, endometrial ablations, pharmaceuticals. And then when you do have a sexual interaction, it's very surface. It lacks connection. But here's the thing, the denial of this archetype within you, this primordial energy, this essence, this feminine, more that you deny it, the louder she screams. Yep. And this is why you're having that pelvic pain. This is why you don't feel anything anymore. This is why um, you are having a ton of, um, you know, menstrual symptoms, PMS, and it's none of it has to be that way. It's just you, we've forgotten how to get to get in touch with that inner guidance system. So, in, but then we've seen in this time, in this era, women, uh, you know, this empowerment era, this like women, we got to go out and do it all. And empowerment to me implies outside validation. It implies hierarchy. It implies power over another in order to feel powerful which in the right environment that can be played out um, and can be so hot. But um, in our lives, we want, and this is what I teach women, we want to explore embodiment. That's the exploration of power through receiving receivership and giving states. Being, yes, getting into a submissive passive state with yourself or with another, and then a dominant state, right? Being able to direct your life being able to bring through that desire into the 3D world. And so now we get to play orgasmically with those two different energies within us. And when a woman starts to touch into that great ocean of desire, which is the feminine, it's desire for desire's sake, uh, like the sun shining, right? It's just pure creation. She starts to really understand um, what desire wants to come through her body and to be birthed into this world. It's exciting stuff. And not only that, you get to experience deeper levels of orgasms and so, and deeper levels of connection and God source. So yes. I really, yeah. yeah, I really truly believe that it's a woman's radical responsibility to work with this ocean of energy. And this is what I teach. It's how to open to this energy and how to channel it. And this, Paul, is where true sovereignty lies, being so connected to your pussy. And these are where states of receivership are felt. You access your desire and then you, you can use softness and tenderness to bring that mm -hmm. desire in. And so this is where we have emotional responsibility, pleasure responsibility, being the expert of your body, using your voice to activate what dignified and nourishing desire wants to come through. And then we have women who are stepping into their grand vision. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, um, you, you know, Amy, we have a mutual friend and connection through Amy Fournier and her podcast is Awakening Aphrodite. And she's 
working in, in, in these lines all the time. And she came to me in a midlife crisis because she really had all the symptoms that you spoke of, taught dance for 30 years and exercise and uh, was a, a, an executive in her father's company for many years with all the male pressures. Right. So, you know, I'm bringing her up too, because I want to let everybody know if you want to get to a good podcast that really addresses a lot of these issues, it's Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. You know, one of the things I want to bring up is this. I think some women listening to you so far might think that the conversation's overly oriented towards sexual pleasure and pussy power. What I'd like to hear you speak about is how does the woman's heart come into this? Mm. That's such a beautiful question, Paul. So there's so many ways I could approach this, but let's start with the um, kind of the biomedicine approach. They're discovering now through some beautiful science through uh, Beverly scientific studies through Beverly Whipple and Barry Komasarek that the vagus nerve, um, as we know, is the longest uh, cranial nerve, it extends through the body um, all the way down um, and actually terminates at the cervix. Mm -hmm. And so when a woman starts to um, connect with this area, with her pelvic space, her womb, she begins to open up this channel in Chinese medicine called the Chong Mai, the penetrating vessel. And mm -hmm. this vessel, as we know, along with the vagus nerve, is connected to your heart. It's connected to your throat. It's connected to your crown, your third eye. And so you really begin to open up your heart in this space. And as you explore deeper pleasure, you'll notice, too, that all these emotions start to rush forward. They call it the crygasm because all of those times that uh, you maybe overstepped or overrode or didn't speak up that all gets stored in the womb. And we, we begin to open and move this energy, this space in the pelvic bowl that's become stagnated because we don't ever interface with her. And you begin to open your heart and that <laughs> oh, love just begins to pour through you. Again, life force begins to pour through you. And so if you want to get in touch with your heart, this is the way, this is how we do it. And even in um, Taoist reflexology, there, it is shown that like the clitoris um, is connected with your kidneys. The va vaginal canal is connected with like spleen and pancreas, lungs. And then your cervix is your heart point. And the men's, fat, uh, the men's uh, cock or penis, uh, the tip of his cock is actually his heart point. And then it, um, the shaft becomes more of like the lung, the spleen, the pancreas, the kidneys. And That's so, why I call it a heart on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do you really? Sure. <laughs> totally. Right. And it's like this sexual pleasure can be this incredible way with yourself or with another to reach, connect with the divine. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yes. And it's interesting too, because if you look at the uh, microcosmic orbit, the conception vessel Mm -hmm. runs right through the center of the body, starts just behind the front teeth, goes through the tongue, through the neck, through the sternum, through the linea alba, mm -hmm. right through the vagina. And the governing vessel begins at the taint between the vagina and the rectum or a man's testicles in the rectum. And then the male vessel runs up the spine and around the head to the front teeth, which as a side note is why it's important to keep your tongue on the roof of your mouth behind the front teeth when you're doing heavy lifting and intense athletic events, or you don't recycle energy effectively, you end up depleting yourself much more quickly. Um, but the, the point I'm driving at is that all these things that you're describing, like the connection with the vagus nerve, the vagina, the heart, the cervix, they're all running off this central meridian because all 12 meridians branch off it. And it's really the, it's called the microcosmic orbit because Really, we are modeled after the whole universe. We're a microcosm of the entire universe. And so I think that, you know, when you reach a state of 
sexual ecstasy, especially if you have simultaneous orgasm with somebody that you have deep love and connection to, you can be blown into the equivalent of a full samadhi and become one with the universe. So I think that it's it's just beautiful that all the energetic connections and to really bring this to a different level to point out what I'm sharing. I, I'd like to share this with you. I, I, I you might not know about this. I've got a book of about 800 pages by a physicist called Life Force. The physicist's name is Claude Swanson. It's all research into life force. It's phenomenal. There's a mind-blowing study in there. I believe it was a Japanese acupuncturist who obviously has a physics bent wondered what the effect of our sun was on the acupuncture meridians. So he coordinated with NASA and they monitored solar flare activity and so solar activity of the sun. And he was monitoring acupuncture needles that he had put in key spots on the body in time with NASA's telescopes looking at the activity of the sun. And he found out something quite, quite mind boggling that defies physics. He found that the instant that the sun would release a solar flare or a burst of energy, the energy running through the acupuncture point and the acupuncture needle instantly responded. Why that's so mind-blowing is because moving at the speed of light, it takes eight minutes for a photon to get from the sun to the acupuncture needle. So he showed that something even more mysterious is happening and that we are all directly connected to the sun 24 seven, and it is beyond the laws of physics. So I bring this up to show that what the points that you're talking about and what I'm referring to in the microcosmic orbit or the central meridian, which Taoism focuses on heavily, I've focused on it for years. We are connected to the whole universe through that whole, through every cell in our body. And it was, the first study I'd ever seen in my life that showed that scientific connection. And therefore, when you're bringing yourself into a state of bliss or pleasure or fulfillment, you're simultaneously giving that to the universe. And when the universe is, it, the universe is always offering us its bliss and fulfillment, but we get so distracted living in the mm. small self and the small view of life and you know, I've got to get this done and I've got all these tasks to do and I'm pissed off because of traffic. But we forget to look at the stars and look at the beauty all around us and the magic and the mystery. And we forget to care for ourselves and we fall into the trap of waiting for somebody else to make us feel good. And, you know, endometriosis is is got a, a slang name. It's called successful white woman's disease, which it doesn't necessarily need to be white woman. It means a woman who's become a business executive or a man. And she gets so yang that she dries out her sex organs. And I've had to rehabilitate countless women from endometriosis, but it, most always it's a process of bringing them back in touch with their feminine and what it means to be a woman. The challenge is that they all say, well, look, you know, I'm divorced. I've got two kids. I have to make a living. I got to take care of kids. Everything you're saying sounds lovely, but how do I do it? And, and I think that's a real crisis in our world. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you, what do you tell a very busy woman who's got a lot of responsibilities and doesn't have the support of a male and has children and financial pressures? And she's wearing the dress and the pants all day. H how do you suggest a woman like that begin the path that you're speaking of? Because, you know, not everybody can just do a pilgrimage and go spend time finding themselves like you did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's um, a really great, great, great question. But what I've learned is that um, when a woman is her life force is trickling, like just through her body, when she, she is in that state of where the pleasure bar is so low. Uh, 
she's not able to, she's in that survival mode, right? It's probably a three day bandwidth of having to make the decisions, having to do all the work, having to take on all of these uh, tasks. And all I would say is that five minutes of connection into the feminine body will radically change your life in the terms of, in terms of what you're able to ask for. Are you able to receive support? Do you seek out support? And are you able to uh, take that five minutes, that 10 minutes of connection, which is free with your body, it's with your hands, whether that's a breast massage, whether that's looking at your yoni, whether that's just putting, placing a finger inside and swirling around, whether that's massaging yourself, whether that's breathing deeply for 10 minutes. Those are all aspects that are getting you into the feminine body. And from that space of pleasure, of flow, of openness, of being in the eternal now, then you can begin to make decisions that are probably going to bring in a uh, an ease, a flow, a joy, a bliss. And so this working in this way is actually, it seems counterintuitive and it seems terrifying, but you're actually breaking down the narratives the more that you come into presence with yourself. And I truly believe like from that place, you can begin to pull yourself into uh, a flowing, a flow state much easier than pushing against a rope in the other way, driving yourself constantly. What I find working with a lot of those women is that they have a really hard time asking for support. Just me. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of the reason they have a hard time asking for support in all fairness, because I've heard this story over and over and over again. You can imagine I've had 38 years of therapy to encounter a lot of women with all sorts of problems, including a lot of world-class athletes. Um, and, and that is that it's sad, but there seems to be a breakdown in the male's understanding of a woman, her needs, and partnership. Um, I think we are in a bit of a crisis of men that seem to be happy getting by doing as little as possible. Now, I'm using a stereotypical approach because not all men are that way, but having listened to the stories and deeply investigated the psychological underpinnings of a lot of the women that I've worked with that are uh, overly masculinized is that they often reach a point where they just feel so alone because they've had so many attempts at finding a man that they can have a balanced, healthy relationship with, and they seem to be repeatedly let down. Um, I'd like to maybe hear your thoughts on that. And then I've got a couple more things before we move on. Yeah, sure. I'm going to make a very, um, I guess, wild stance on this and saying that um, for me, I guess in my path and in my journey, I learned that it's all 100% my responsibility. If I'm being the, my process of going into my body and taking uh, emotional responsibility my own self-sufficiency of becoming like a in a pleasure state. When I was single, I was a very well fucked woman, and that was all with myself. <laughs> so, oh, okay. well, you would have probably was, had no problem either way. I mean, for those well, that can't yeah, see right. Emily, I mean, imagine a really good-looking girl with a super fit body, and you pretty much got it. I mean, right, you'd be like I, a guy I felt, magnet, <laughs> right? But I was. I had just been in a very brutal relationship. So what did that tell me? That told that told me that my whatever there was something inside of me that was pulling in relationships that needed to mirror something back to me. Absolutely. Like, that were deeply painful, right? So I brave enough to say that. Congratulations. Well, for I had to because like in that ashram, I had to face everything that um, I had created. It was all me. And, you know, I had felt guilty and I had felt shameful about being this almost in a prostitution role. And I think I remember listening to a podcast of you talking about that, of being in this almost prostitution role for sponsorships and, you know, making posts about all of these 
uh, products that I really didn't believe in. And it, so it was, I was completely out of integrity and I it attracted in someone who wasn't in integrity. And I had no ability to create healthy boundaries around that. I had no ability to ask for what I wanted. I faked orgasms all the time because I was a performer. And so when I hear women say, there's no good men out there and like, I've tried. No, I'm sorry, you haven't. I know women go through such immense things. I work with women. Like I, I see their pain and I, I help them move that energy. Um, but that's why I chose after that time, I said, all right, I'm going all in on myself. And I devoted, I became devotional to my body. And through, and through that, I became really clear at discerning what I wanted to pull into my life. Not just another distraction, not just like getting on an app and clicking here and there. What I was going to call in was something epic. And I trusted myself. I became, tr I trusted my experience and my feelings, my intuition. I trusted God and I trusted that whatever was brought into my life was going to serve me on my spiritual evolution. And uh, I wrote down exactly what I wanted in a lover, in a man. And whatever part of that, uh, in, on that list, I was not, I went out and I became that because I knew I wanted to meet me on this journey, not for every, anybody else. And once I learned that, oh my God, I could make love to myself better than anything I've experienced in my 30 years so far that's when things got really exciting because I became a self-sufficient, radiant, juicy woman all on my own. And then I started to realize, oh my God, I have so much magnetism and so much power in that. And that opens you up and wakes you up to how much responsibility you need once you start tapping into your sexual power. Hi, everybody. I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was, or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in the book, or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online, or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, it aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure, go to organifi.com forward slash check 20. That's organifi.com forward slash check 20. Get 20% off with your promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's capitals, check 20. Enjoy Organifi Pure. This is a hard one for a lot of people. When you take responsibility for pleasuring yourself, you don't have to be needy and codependent in a relationship and expecting someone else to pleasure you. And I think males and females have fallen deeply into that trap of expecting someone else to give them an orgasm or make them feel good sexually and if he's tired, then she's frustrated because she's not able to get her sexual needs met or vice versa or all the excuses people throw at them. But what I've found in my life is that when you have sexual intimacy with somebody who doesn't need you but wants to share with you the intensity of the experience and the depth of orgasm is so significantly greater because people that have power games going on or um, neediness going on haven't really come into their own power yet. So I notice with women, often they have a hard time orgasming. And I find when I explore why that is with them, it's because in many instances, they don't want to give away their power. And I say to them, 
you know, if you would give it to yourself and realize that you always have the power and you always have the pleasure, yes. then you wouldn't have to be worried about somebody. See, because the, the unconscious thought there is if he can bring me to an orgasm and I really, really just let go, then I'm going to need him all the time. Therefore, they mm. don't realize that they're holding their orgasm back because ultimately at the unconscious level, the soul wants them to have that power for themselves and not need somebody else to do it. And when you have that power and you have access to it, then you get to go share with your lover and you're not afraid to release it because you aren't in a needy relationship. So it's not like yeah. now I have to hire Mr. Pussy to come fix me every time I'm feeling down or need a fix. It's, it's, I've got a gift that I want to share with you <laughs> and it's an act of love. It's, you know, it gets rid of all the, shall we say, shallow, um, games of sex that the aboriginal culture figured out how to alleviate a long time ago that the native yes. tribe elders would have coached young men and women through in many tribal societies but with all the kind of puritanical christian and abrahamic religious influences you know our whole orientation towards our bodies and our sex has been so twisted and so contorted so you know my observation is and many times I've encouraged women to pleasure themselves. And, you know, one of the first comments I get is, oh, I can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't do it? And, you know, next thing you know, it's a talk about what their religious beliefs are or whatever. And I go, so you think God doesn't want you to have an orgasm, but God's happy with you torturing the shit out of yourself, having endometriosis, feeling like crap, burned out, drinking half a pot of coffee just to get through the day. So God's okay with that, but your God won't let you have an orgasm. I mean, <laughs> you know, like this is how contorted the the programming is in, in a lot of people and a lot of women. I've also found in many cases, I've encouraged women to masturbate, but they say that they don't have any feeling there. So one of the things yeah. that I found interesting that was helpful, I say, try doing it in a hot bath, get yourself relaxed, put some Epsom salts, put some essential oils that smell good to you. There are also oils that will en enhance sex, you know, stimulate the sex centers. And some of them have been good with that. The, the one thing I haven't heard you talk about though, because I've, I've worked in this area as well, is that, you know, there's been women I've had that have had multiple children, their vagina gets traumatized and stretched out and they lose feeling. And so they have a hard time getting sexually aroused. And I find in a lot of these cases, if they use their rectum for sexual pleasure, that that can open the gates and they can even reach rectal orgasm. And that reconnects them with their sexuality. I'm wondering what your thoughts in that regard are. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting thought. Um, I do actually in my practice um, work rectally because, yes, I think the anus is so ignored and it's such a center of shame and uh, repulsion for a lot of people. And when you begin to love your own anus and explore your own anus yourself, um, then you can really invite in a partner. Um, and, and that's such an energetic opening. It's not like just a ton of lube. It's like so much deep, deep trust. Um, but for women who postpartum, and again, women, I think women of all ages, like they, this should be taught in school. But when a woman really starts how to, learns how to work with the, the muscles and the tissues of her pelvic bowl um, and her pubovaginalis, the uh, iliococcygeus, the pubococcygeus, and the piriformis, and starts hydrating that tissue all of the time through her own self-touch and or coming to a woman that can tend to her tissues and realign her uterus and um, her uh, work with her fascial lines, like the deep front line. All of a sudden, that tissue starts to heal. It's just like how I would get if I got a really tight um, shoulder and things started to get kinked up, I would go get it massaged. I'd go get it worked on. Well, it's the same with your yoni. And so a lot of women have, when they get pregnant, that's the first time they're actually truly connecting. They're connected with their, that space. 
And so, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation we could get into of like not being connected, um, especially female athletes only knowing how to push really hard and to endure insane amounts of pain. Um, and yes, doing wild damage to the, the vaginal canal and to, um, the, uh, perineum, the perineal body. But the more that you work with this space, you're bringing in more blood flow. You're bringing in for more lymph. You're, um, letting those capillaries know, like the, all that capillary tissue, um, network that is in charge of your engorgement or your two, tumescence. You're letting, you're creating more space so that blood can actually flow in and help that whole area engorge. And that's where the feeling starts to come back in. And not Mm -hmm. only that, there's that emotional connection that's like helping those nerves reawaken because as we know, um, chi flows where attention goes or reverse that. Um, So it's really just a manner of inhabiting this space again. And um, I think that maybe the recommendation of like, oh, well, you should go have uh, anal sex. I think that women just need this care. They need to learn how to care for their bodies. And then they can teach their lovers, their men in their life, how to give them a yoni massage and how to continually bring hydration and blood back to these adhesed tissues. Yeah, I don't even think it needs to be anal sex like a man uh, putting their penis there. I think it's just self-pleasuring because the, the area is... You know, unless a woman has an episiotomy, which they don't really do that often anymore, the nerve centers are usually quite intact. It's a lot of parasympathetic stimulation. It creates a lot of the sim- similar types of engorgement, sexual excitement. Um, you know, of course, you have the, the whole mind block to it, but that's part of the reason they're seeing a therapist, right? That, that that's right. part of the pro- part of the the healing. Um, the other thing that I found very helpful, I'm curious. Uh, of your thoughts is that um, I find with women going through the kinds of things we're talking about that the use of um, even low dose mushrooms, like one gram of, of magic mushrooms, or uh, there's a number of psychedelics that'll do it. But uh, I've, I've found that that really can open up everything for them and, and help them get out of their head and get more, much more sensual. Have you got any comments in that regard? Absolutely. I think um, the power of, uh, like, I have a friend here who who harvests and his own uh, marijuana and his and grows it and harvests it himself and has bees. Um, you know, takes the honey from the bees that are uh, uh, sucking from that uh, weed flower. And I've had experiences where I've been able to take a little bit of this honey marijuana mix and experience my first cervical orgasm with my partner. And that was all through slowing down um, and connecting in. And what what is that? That's the feminine body. And it's her asking for much more slowness. Because when we slow everything down and almost to the point where we feel nothing, that's when we begin to feel everything. Because the feminine body, a lot of women too, they don't feel safe in their body. They don't, they're literally constantly in that um, low-grade parasympathetic or sympathetic state where they're in that stress cycle and it just keeps building and building. And so that's why they may have IBS. That's why they have anxiety and depression because they are not connected to pleasure and um, that feminine body. And so I think, yeah, that's like such a beautiful way to make a ceremony or a ritual with yourself or with a partner of tapping into your body and um, using the power of medicine, that plant medicine to move, uh, the energy, the stagnation of what's carried in your womb. And all your body wants, Paul, like you're, the feminine will take you on mind-blowing, mind-bending pleasure adventures because all she wants is you to tell the truth of her body. And when I do that with my own lovemaking with my man, and there's still times where maybe we went to penetration too quick, she'll let me know. Um, but when I am able to, within the moment of us making love, when there's something that maybe isn't, um, it just doesn't feel right to me. And when I'm able to voice that to him with love and through such a beautiful, like, Hey, like, I love what you're doing, but right now my heart feels really open. I would love to go in this direction. 
your pussy will respond will respond with insane pleasure because she's like, wow, you just used your voice to speak on behalf of me. And you yes. historically, our mothers never got to do that. Our grandmothers never got to do that. But you get to do that now in this life. And that's all she wants. And you will experience, like, she'll take you deeper and deeper and deeper just when you think you've got it all figured out. I think another thing too, and I believe you and I did touch on this in our private conversations, we we do have a bit of a issue of men really that nobody teaches them the anatomy of a vagina, how it works, what's pleasure. Like there's just, there's not really a sex education for males and how to relate to females. You know, I love the Aboriginal culture because in the Aboriginal culture men aren't allowed to get married usually until 38 to 40 years of age, but they're encouraged to have sex with as many of the married women as possible. And the married women, it's their task as the women of the tribe to educate the younger men to how to pleasure a woman and how to be a husband. And only after all the women in the tribe have given a young man the stamp of approval that he's ready to be married now, will the chief woman go ahead and approve him to be married. So they usually spend all the way from puberty right up till 38 to 40 years of age, going from woman to woman, learning how a different woman behaves, what her needs are. So they get a a schooling, Mm -hmm. a real honest schooling in what a woman is, how to meet her needs. And, And we don't have that for men. And I think that's Part of the problem is that a lot of guys really don't know what to do with the instrument except stick their dick in there and and so on and so forth. But it's kind of like a mechanic with 200 tools that only knows how to use one of them, you know? And it's like, okay, well, that's not what a mechanic is. A mechanic knows how to use all his tools. And so I think there's a... uh, I think there's a real vacuum. Maybe your next course needs to be for men. Yes. Okay. And this, should we call it Mr. Pussy? <laughs> well, yeah, you, you could for sure. You know? Um. Yeah. I think that Paul, um, here's, and I love that you're bringing in uh, like Aboriginal traditions. Cause I was, I got really into the Kudoshka, Kudoshka tradition for a while. And they do talk about the acquired awareness that all of us receive with our sexual education. And let's, it's sexual education, but it's not pleasure education. Um, and I would even say that they don't even teach women like when they're fertile signs. So they just terrify you at the prospect of um, getting pregnant, pregnant or getting an STI. So um, yeah, so women end up becoming, and like, I love it. The Kudoshka tradition talks about how women are egg carriers in the acquired awareness model, right? The stories that are given to us, they become, women become overly compliant and they do not properly care for what they conceived in this world. Like they don't, it's like they don't have that creative agency. And so a lot of resentment ends up building um, on the woman because of the social expectations and um, the sexual stagnation that she uh, never truly feels fulfilled. Um, and then you have like those seed spreaders, which are the men who are kind of careless with their seed, their words, their actions. They resent feeling trapped. They lack sensitivity, but they're hungry for sexual experiences, um, but also deny sexual feelings. So really we have two like women, a woman and a man that are so hungry for deeper connection, but they don't know how to get, get there. And so there's this endless power struggle within relationships and surface lover level pleasure. And what is that? It's your vision and your truth. They're not coming forward. So your relationship with yourself and your woman is only operating at 50% of its energetic capacity. And so for the men out there listening, like, do you want to be worshiped? Do you want to be worshipped as a man? Well, it's time, like if you do, it's time to step into your kingly throne to move into this integrated epoch. And we, I want to invite men into this incredible uh, way of being and to know that they, um, I would not be where I am today, like right now, if I did not have the love of such an epic king. 
And I did that through really learning myself. And um, this is about a movement towards integration of the masculine and feminine principles so that you can begin to co-create between you and your woman and bring everything to the collaboration table to solve the seemingly impossible problems. Um, and that res- in that resistance, you got to start loving that tension is where you find the treasure within. And so um, what I wanted to talk about just briefly is this idea. I wrote a paper on this called the French call it le, p- le petit mort, right? The, um, the little death. And within each orgasm, each orgasmic experience um, is an atomic reordering of your body as it's flooded with electrical and chemical and thermal energy. And so it's a unification and separation of energy. And so we know, Paul, um, that the ancient esoteric art of harnessing this reordering for one's own desires is called sexual uh, transmutation. And this is where we can do a veritable quantum leap into co-creational power with the ethers of the universe, the Tao, the field of fields. And you can do this with your partner, with your woman. And so I, ca- I like to call it the horizontal, horizontal subatomic tango. <laughs> and so each act of sacred sexuality, each act of orgasm um, has its profound ability to re- resonate like that of the laws of the universe. And so you get to recreate, just like every day waking up, um, and recreating your day and how you want it to feel, you too can do this with your lovemaking. And so with men, and I am planning on creating this uh, course for them and an offering, is that you want a woman that is well-fed, she's well-fucked, she's gushing, she's juicy, she wants to worship your cock, she's in a state of pleasure. Um, and the lovemaking that you two create together has her content for a week or weeks. And that's possible. And so that's her responsibility to go in and start discovering that. Um, But this woman is a force of nature. And so for a man, like you want your woman to step into this power, you want her to be in this state of pleasure. And I remember giving my first tantric massage to a woman. Um, I remember looking down at her body and looking at her yoni and I was so intimidated. I was so nervous because it's this, the woman's body is just jaw dropping and it's, it's mysterious. And you, you place your fingers inside of her and you're just like, I don't really know what's going on. But what was so cool about that experience is that when I was massaging this woman and I started to bring her into pleasure and I maybe shifted too early or, or, um, touched a spot that she didn't want to be touched, she voiced to me what she wanted. And that was so incredible. I felt so empowered when I was uh, bringing her to her orgasmic state because I was like, wow, I get to give this woman this gift of intense pleasure. And she helped me get herself there. It was so, so powerful. That's a very, very, very important point because one of the things that I've seen in so much relationship counseling where there's a lot of sexual tension and abrasiveness as the underlying theme that, you know, when a woman's, when a man or a woman's not sexually satisfied or connected, then it causes the projection of everything else. Now the underwear laying on the floor is a big deal or, you know, the, the, the little things become big things, but really those are just symptoms of a lack of connection, which means a lack of feeling love together and, and, expressing the creative juices in the relationship. But one of the things that I've seen over and over again is that women seem to be inhibited about showing men what pleasures them. Literally yeah. saying, honey, look, this is how a vagina works. This is how mine works. This is what makes me feel good. Now, I don't know a man alive that doesn't just get so turned on by watching a woman pleasure herself but very few women offer that to a man to support them and educate them in what is special about her, what her specific needs are, likes are, nor the communication. Um, you know, a lot of women will have sex with a man. He'll ejaculate and be happy, but she'll be frustrated because she doesn't feel like she's been anything for him but a, a place to masturbate with her body. 
And I would love it if you could say something to inspire the women to let them know that they can really go a long ways by taking the opportunity to really show a man what makes them feel good and know that I haven't met a man yet that doesn't find that extremely erotic. And, you know, you don't need Viagra when you got a woman that'll show you how to play with her pussy. I can promise you that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and you don't really actually need lube, a ton of lube when a woman is in a state of wetness and in a state right. of juice and pleasure. Right. And so, um, I always tell women like, first off, a lot of women, we've been handed down story, sexual stories of how to relate to our sex and how to how the fabric of our culture is really indoctrinated in suppression of female sexuality because it is so big. It is so vast. It's endless. But speaking biomedically, like women have to understand, again, there's all these incredible studies coming out on sexuality. A, Masters and Johnson created a linear model of uh, pleasure. And that's been thrown out, right? We are very much, women are super sensitive um, to their conditions. And so I hear women a lot being like, well, the conditions have to be perfect. I'm like, good. That's great. Create beautiful conditions for you to give yourself pleasure and have a space where you can do that to yourself so that you can then transmute that into your partner and you creating a beautiful space and creating, clearing the space between you two so that you may connect deeper. I also talk about that in these studies, they showed different, um, they did an fMRI as a woman was pleasuring herself in different areas, clitoris, vaginal canal, G spot, A spot, um, and then cervix. And different parts of the paracentral lobule of her brain were lit up. And so these are nerve connections. They are there. We have all these sweet nerve bundles. It's literally a chance for you to go explore them and to really understand, yeah, what makes you hot? What makes you to nest? And by doing that, again, you're opening up that erectile tissue to be able to expand. You're softening all that tissue. You're removing any energetic blocks. You're getting into the feminine body so you can get out of your head. And so for women, a lot of times, because we have inherited stories that our mothers probably weren't, didn't ever speak up about what they wanted sexually. We, for the first time in my lineage, I'm asking the question, how do I want to express myself sexually? That's huge. And so that's a, a lot um, to parse through when you're in the moment with your lover and you want to ask for something. And that vulnerability, though, is your ability to be vulnerable with yourself first. And then that thrill of when I was, when I told my partner that I wanted uh, our sexual energy or like the way our sexual encounter uh, was going to change, I was terrified. I thought I was going to, um, you know, emasculate him or, or tell him or make him feel like he wasn't good enough. But when I languaged it with love and from my true desire, that's when you receive everything that you want. And so it's getting over that little hump or like punching through that little paper wall of story that we've created to really be honest about who we are and what we want. And to be seen that way by your lover is inc an incredible feeling. That's true connection. That's true intimacy because that your lover is going to want to meet that. It's gonna, he's going to want to meet you there. And any lover that doesn't want to meet you there, he's not worth his salt. He just isn't, right? He's the he's wrong just not lover. He's the wrong lover. And um, so, yeah, I always, we have these sweet little nerve plexuses and bundles of different nerves in our pelvis that are just waiting to be lit up. They're waiting to be explored by you. And then using that voice, connecting to your heart and your voice, that being able to open up in front of your lover, which is why I'm not a proponent of like casual sex either, right? It has to be like, so deeply connected and you got to go explore and experiment. But for me at this point in my life, I wanted something so deep. I wanted something mind blowing. So that's what I went for. That's what I magnetized. Well, I think, I think that's a very important point because, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so you just hit dead ends after dead ends, but it's like, you know, if you go to a restaurant and the, and the waitress says, what do you want? And you say, I don't know. 
and you yes. say, just bring me anything. Well, then you just get stuck with whatever leftovers they want to throw at you. And I think that, you know, as a man, I know that women are quite a lot more complex in their anatomy, their physiology, their hormonal regulation, their hormonal balance. And women have 30% more commissurial fibers connecting the left and the right brain hemispheres. So there's a lot more activity. There's a lot more, not only sensory awareness, but there's a lot more environmental awareness because they're wired to intuitively know what their kids are up to without being able, without seeing them. So you know, I tell men all the time, if you think you're going to get away with lying to a woman, uh, you're not very smart because they, they're, they've got a radar on them that you can't even conceive and you're going to find out the hard way, hopefully not through a divorce. The point I'm driving at, though, is that because women are so dynamic, men, as a, as a general thing, you know, they, they, they're happy to just get an erection, have some sex, have a good time, blow it out, feel good. And most guys aren't really too fixated on having, you know, oh, it has to be this way, or I need it slow, or I need it fast. It's, I think for most men, just having sex is fun, no matter how it goes down. But I think that a lot of women, a, a lot of women need to educate men and like you said, share it with love that, you know, maybe today I don't feel like being in a rodeo. I need softer pleasure. I need something more gentle or I, I, I need more foreplay today or, you know, you know, there, there just seems to me a, a lot of lack of communication. Well, and that's because women just, like you said, they really don't know what they want. Well, why is that? Because they haven't explored not- it. They haven't explored it. And I, I, so, um, I asked women, it's like, if you were super confident and like knew you could have whatever you would, whatever you want, what would you want? And they can't answer it because it's such a big question. And they, and it's not just like they're, they're mired in the stories of like, well, you know, I would just maybe want to raise or I would just want, uh, you know, a, a better man or whatever, but it's like, no, what lights you up? What makes your pussy, your womb, your heart tingle? What wants to come through you? And it's because they haven't spent or the time or been educated at how to access the deeper states of pleasure, which helps them access their true desires. The ones that are attuned specifically for that soul, which is held in the sacrum right? Which is where we know Kundalini energy is activated. And I've been in sessions with women where they start to feel that activation. They start to feel that snake slithering around them. And that is that Kundalini rising of, okay, now your soul is on the right path. Now you can speak your truth. Now you can be in a state of going after your dreams and you can do so with joy, with pleasure, with connection to God, with integrity, whatever you desire. It's about getting, understanding what you desire. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so We've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 to save 15%. 
I just had a question pop into my head about five times now as I'm listening to you. And the question is, I'd really be curious to know how your mother responds to your life and how you express yourself and, and, you know, the journey that you're on and that you're in. This is so beautiful, Paul. I'm so glad you asked this because the more of my healing I've done sexually, the more it has expanded my ability to tell people like how much I love them. And also I've seen it starting to heal my family. Mm. The, for me, exploring my pleasure and rewriting the stories from my lineage, which I, through holotropic breathwork and I, you know, I've done all kinds of things, um, but really getting to the root, my root has had vast implications of not only my relationship with myself, but with my lover, with my family, with my community, um, with my influence. And this all started from me just taking my fingers down into my body and listening. And so my mother has, our conversation has opened up glorious things about like her sexuality and things that she went through in her life. Um, and my mother and father are in their um 60s, like my dad's almost 70, and they're having a renaissance of their sexuality. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And um, and my dad has, you know, initially he was so um uncomfortable with what I was talking about, but it's helped us heal a lot of the father-daughter um dynamics that when a woman's sexuality comes online at puberty can be so disruptive and so um, damaging and really set in motion, at least it did for me, how I related to my sexuality, which was with a lot of shame and guilt because I wanted to explore so much, but I really denied myself um, my desires, which then um, emerge in a lot of self-sabotaging ways, which with the women I work with, they often come to me in crises. They come to me with, I've this is the life or the reality of the situation I've created. And it's usually from such a suppression or denial of their feminine desires. I think it would be a, a good metaphor to say that you had repressed your own sexuality to the degree that that, that energy could clean and jerk 250 pounds and do CrossFit competitions and kill yourself physically because they're, that that's real energy, right? It's, it's, it's life force that's trapped. And so I think a lot of women don't realize that they're taking that trapped life force energy that can be healthfully expressed through sex. And it's becoming workaholism or bitchiness or um, addiction or eating, yeah. you know, overeating. And I think, um, you know, when you really get back to the core of the being and the the need, we are, we're all creative beings. And if we don't move the energy of God consciousness through us, it's so powerful. It comes out sideways because it's hard yeah. to hold that in you, right? Yes. I'm, I'm a very creative man. If I don't paint, create things in my garden, stack rocks, express my creativity i i literally start feeling like a caged animal mm. and, but but there's so many people that 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 don't realize that that what's leading to all these addictive behaviors and 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 bodily traumatic eating patterns and staying up late at night watching pornography i mean come on watching pornography is such a it's just such a poor substitute for real sexual experience. I mean, you're looking at, you're looking at images of somebody else. It's like, you know, life is a partici participation sport. It's, it's like you're watching fake sex on television and there's a huge population of men that say they can't even get an erection unless they're watching porn. I'm like, this is like, we are seriously disconnected from authentic connection to ourselves, to honest connection to our sexual pleasures, to, to, to moving life through us, you know, it takes life to create life. But if you start using substitutes then you just create more substitutes and the next thing you know, you've got a world full of 
digital fakeness, lies, manipulation, corruption, greed, and shadow, all of that, I think, really can be healed by having a, an authentic, intimate relationship with yourself because if that's one really good way to meet God and not the God yeah. that you read about in other people's books, but the God that was so excited to be you that it created you and said, let's do this together. You know? <laughs> yes. It's, I love that you talked about that because I, I literally trained myself in, I placed myself in a box, which is what a CrossFit gym is called. And I trained all day. I was a trapped animal. No wonder everything went sideways in my life. Like it literally blew up in my face. And I, oh, but I tell women too, like, especially the female athlete, like you can still like, I remember when I got into feminist, feminine wellness culture and started, um, you know, exploring Yoni work, they told me that like women shouldn't even be weightlifting. Women should be doing yoga and long walks. And I, of course. Just kind of, <laughs> I flipped them the bird because I was like, that ain't me. Like, I love to be thrashed by a wave. I love to push myself up to the top of a mountain. That's how I really express my divinity, you know, and connect with God. And so I tell women, it, they, especially women who are in the more masculine, like athletic archetype, uh, the warrior goddess, they've just forgotten the goddess part of themselves. But it, to explore the goddess, you don't need to give up the warrior, you're actually aligning into a healthier balance between the two, and a more pure um, exploration or expression of the masculine and feminine. So like knowing how to massage your own uh, vagina after a day of deadlifting or like lifting stones or lifting sandbags or gardening, that is medicine. That is such medicine. You're literally caring for your body in a way that nobody else can. You're becoming the expert on it. Knowing when your cervix is a little bit out of position, you're like, oh, okay, my womb's a little bit out of position. You can help manipulate that or bring that womb back into healthy alignment. It literally feels like a pulse of fresh blood flow when it comes back into alignment. So this is like not just about like pleasure. This is about overall health and wellness, being able to communicate with your ovaries, understanding what pussy is asking you. Uh, Emily, before the next question, there's something that keeps nagging me and it's my intuitive access to the collective unconscious. And one of the things that the, the, uh, my inner compass is sensing is that there's probably quite a lot of women out there that are going to have a negative reaction because there's so much pussy talk and it might sound so physical to them or so base sexual. How would you address a woman who has her own blocks and maybe religious programming and, and, and kind of has a defense reaction to a conversation like this or to an exploration like you have done on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I encounter that kind of energy, because I encounter it a lot, women get angry, they get triggered yes. when they start talking about mm -hmm. what's possible. And I can completely empathize because I would have too. I would have said, fuck you. You know, if someone started talking to me about this five years ago. Um, but I want to speak to that energy behind that initial resistance, because all of that is conditioning. And it's so normal it is. to come up. It's so, so normal. And so once that, that initial like barbs come out or that um, upset, I talk behind, I talk behind that and to the woman who wants a life that is radically, sanely present to the one that she is living. One that is, um, has a possibility to be filled with so much juice and so much pleasure. And all it takes is curiosity. And that resistance, that resistance that she's feeling is beneath that is a buried treasure. And what if, what would life look like for you? if you could live fully expressed, how would that feel? And I think it's possible that all women can experience more than just a little clitoris quick hit orgasm with a vibrator. Um, all women can experience Amrita, 
orgasm, which is a true opening of uh, the heart. And also is really important um, that that cervical, that em- re- uh, cervical vaginal fluid, that emrita is expelled from the body uh, because it's, it releases so many great antimicrobial uh, proteins um, at the same time. And I believe that all women can experience cervical orgasms, which is the true ecstasy and connection um, into a non-ordinary state of consciousness. This is possible for every woman. And I like to show that through um, the science, um, through discovering her own intuition, and through uh, deepening her connection with herself or God. And uh, yeah, it's all possible. Even though the initial conditioning is super uncomfortable um, and super almost cringy when I first heard the word pussy. But I would like to say that there's pusillanimous which means to be weak or lack courage in the English language. And then there's Mm. pussy, which is like, you know, a woman who's really inhabiting her pussy and going after her dreams, you know, riding off Mm. into the sunset uh, with wild abandon. Then that's the other pussy. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've spoken about to women that have this resistance, because I've encouraged many women to masturbate, especially when they're having problematic relationships with their spouse and all the complications. And, um, you know, they can, they, they can get defensive or I don't want to talk about that. Or I didn't come here for you to talk about that to me. And mm-hmm. I ask them, I say, okay, I'll, I have a question for you. And I need you to be honest with yourself and look inside yourself. When I ask you this question, and that's, of course, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to them. I see where is all this energy that you're not able to release because your sexual energy is pent up? Where's it all going? Have you ever really looked at what you're doing with that energy? How are you using that? How are you alleviating the deep emptiness that you feel from a lack of true feminine connection, pleasure, and mm. self-responsibility, self-sustainability, and the freedom that will come with that. And usually the first reaction is tears. And, mm. and you know, some will just go silent and they won't say anything, but I know that now they're in introspection. And some will admit that, well, that's why I'm addicted to this, or that's why I um, exercise constantly, or that's why I'm so angry all the time. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so I think it's very important for people to really look at it because really ultimately what we're speaking about is not just pleasure, it's deep, intimate connection to oneself. And, you know, as Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true, or thou canst be true to any man, any other man or woman. And I, I think that there's a lot of really deep cultural blockage and programming that that my my advice to any woman listening who's aligning with what i'm saying or, or even feeling triggered by what we've been talking about is to realize that when you're triggered it means that there's something that's not healed in you you know triggers are are doorways to what jung called complexes which are emotionally charged neural centers in the brain that are linked up to events in one's life that caused pain, fear, or trauma, uh, or some kind of invasiveness. And so what I find is the more triggered people get with a conversation like this, the more in need of honest healing that they have, and that the triggering is a matter of rejecting, which is really the child archetype wanting somebody to come fix them instead of taking the responsibility of their own freedom in their own hands, which goes right back to the, to the men and women that want somebody else to pleasure them instead of doing it for themselves. There's another issue that, that I've run across and I wanted to hear your thoughts on is, and it's sad, you know, there's been times coaching women with these issues that it's been hard for me to hold the tears back. Um, 
But one of the common things I've heard, you know, particularly if I'm doing intrapelvic work with women, because then there's a level of trust that they they develop because I'm inside them and working with them and helping them with any number of problems. Some of them have had sexual traumas, some of them physical traumas, um, some of them just pelvic floor gets all entangled from complications like upper cervical problems, a bite or occlusal dysfunction, craniofacial um, imbalances that are affecting the pelvic girdle. But many times, Emily, I've had women tell me with tears in their eyes, I don't feel like I deserve mm -hmm. to have the pleasure. I don't feel like I deserve the joy of an orgasm. I'm afraid that I won't know how to handle it. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's some kind of background guilt or shame around it. And often it's connected to religious programming, but I would love to hear you address a woman that feels she doesn't deserve to have the kind of experiences that you're talking about, because it's, mm. it's a, it's a sad reality. Yeah. Oh, that makes me really sad. Um, I remember, I guess I, I'll relate it to my own personal experience, but I remember, you know, always being so in my head that I was so concerned more about, you know, in my performance brain, I was so concerned about the other man, like my man's pleasure instead of my own. And when the attention was put on me, I was so uncomfortable. I didn't want it to be necessarily. Um, and so I tell women, look, like your pelvic bowl is an alchemical container of transformation. Anything, anything you've had done to you, any trauma you've suffered, any um, pain, any time you've overstepped, um, these are all your lineage, what's been the stories handed down to you, um, the fabric of our culture of that um, split from spirit and earth, um, the womb, the great mother, um, that's all been stored in this place. And the work that we're doing now is opening up into the feminine body and learning how to experience what I call receivership. It's what is called receivership. And that is, it's like developing a muscle. It's going to feel gross to, um, and almost undeserving to even get into that space initially. And I still, even when I'm experiencing deeper levels of pleasure with my partner, I still, it comes up that I'm like, I can't, I can't receive anymore, but I tell myself I can receive, I can receive, I can expand deeper into, um, pleasure. And so this really is about, I think that where that comes from a like shame and guilt are powerful tools of control on female sexuality and on sexuality and male sexuality, but B too, it's a, um, it's a deep, deep wound of almost feeling like you can't receive life force. Because to be truly present and to when you, when God rushes in, when life force, life force rushes into you, you experience like, oh my God, I get to live this life in this woman's body and experience all of this. It is deeply humbling. And it, it, it brings tears to my eyes every time I come into that space of like, thank you God for this experience, because this is it. This is it's almost women are terrified of being so in the now and not living in story anymore that that is almost overwhelming to even conceptualize. And so receiving the gift of this life is the true benefit of this work and letting that flow through you. Um, and it's, it will take time to develop, but it's right there for you for that taking. Yes. I think that's great for women to hear. Now, another one that I've had several times come up with women that haven't orgasmed with their male partner mm -hmm. is I've asked them, well, why do you feel that is? And, and usually there's a pause and a little bit of a look of um, 
kind of like, I don't know, like a little girl that's gotten away with something. But the comment I've gotten several times is, Paul, when I truly orgasm, I kick, scratch, bite, cry, and fly, and I know he couldn't handle it. It would scare the shit out of him. And I'm like, well, how do you know? And so they say, I just know. So mm. it makes me sad that there's women that think they're in relationships with men that actually cannot handle the full release of the power within them. And, and for me, that's when I feel the most alive when I get to experience that. What do you have to say to a woman who's holding back her power because she thinks her man's not going to be able to handle it? <laughs> um, like that's for me initially, like all of this comes back to self intimacy and what is intimacy? It's into me. I see. So if yes. you're able to receive yourself, if you're able to look yourself in the mirror while you massage your yoni, while you massage your breasts and just be totally in love with the person that you are, if you're able to, um, take yourself on two hour sexual self explorations and enjoy uh, and explore and let yourself unleash your uh, orgasm, then what is out of integrity in the relationship that you can't with your man, with you and your man that you can't open that up? And how do you know now you're in, you're out of your own experience and you're assuming that someone can't handle something. So yeah, I find that really interesting. You know, is it a self-conscious thing on their part? Are they scared of what might come up? Um, I think so, I remember, yeah. Yeah, I remember, because when you do, yeah, when you do start tapping into female sexuality, it is a little scary. Because it's, it, you know, you'll, you're going to feel some fear. You're going to feel some rage. You're going to feel some shame and guilt. But that is the initial flowing. It's like when you go on a, a psychedelic experience, you initially all of that conditioning and story comes up. You breathe through it, you let it be there, you witness it because it has a place. And then it begins to dissolve as you expand deeper into your that presence of that experience. So I always tell women, trust it, like trust your experience because women don't trust themselves. They don't trust their experience. But even too, like when it comes to like premenstrual emotions, trust that there's something there. Anytime we meet resistance in life, there's some gold there. And you have to be brave and have courage to go into that. That's the heroine's journey is to see all of that and still go in anyway, because there's something waiting for you that will be mind blowing and mind bending. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research in science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the kind of re rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back uh, from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our, our company. 
That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. Where can people get their new magnesium breakthrough formula? All they need to do is go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living4d. Put in Paul 10, get 10% discount on your first bottle. And of course, if you order multiple bottles, you can get an extensive discount on that as well. And like everything else, we sell 365 day money back guarantee. If this isn't the best magnesium you've ever taken in your life, we demand that you tell us and we can give you your money back. But I think you're probably going to demand, hey, can I get more of this? <laughs> that, that's probably more the truth. So that's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com forward slash living number four, and then the letter D, code Paul 10. Enjoy deeper relaxation and better nutrition with Mag Breakthrough. I think another thing too is is that there's often a lack of variety in people's sex life. They sort of settle into old age after about two years of being together or something. You know, it's like they've become old people. <laughs> and um, it reminds me, I I had a girlfriend, uh, you know, in my probably late late thirties, thirty six, thirty seven. She was five foot ten super athlete, rode in the rodeo, played on the boys football team in high school. None of my friends could beat her in one-on-one -on -one in basketball, even guys that were really proud of their basketball skills. I used to just love watching her just torture these guys in basketball. But I bring her up because one of her things that she liked to do just to keep it fun and interesting, sometimes I'd come home from work and she'd just be standing there with a look in her eyes and she goes, take me, take me any way you can, but you got to fight for it. And <laughs> a couple of times we just destroyed our house, man. Cause she really wanted me to rape her out of love. Like, you know, not, not rape her like a stranger, but she wanted me to use the strength of my manhood to take her. And this yes. could go on for like, we would both be just covered in sweat. I remember one time we smashed a coffee table. The whole house would just be like a football team had gone crazy in there. But, you know, and I've had other experiences like that too, but I bring this up to make the point, like if, if you fall into such a repetitive kind of like, I don't even have a, a, a good analogy for it. You know, it's just like oatmeal. <laughs> yeah, it's just boring. It's like going to the restaurant, eating the same thing every day. And just it's so it, it it tends to take the excitement out of sex, which is why I brought that particular girlfriend up. And I could give you 50 other very interesting stories like it. <laughs> but what, what is what is you? What is your advice for, for people that are either inhibited or their sex life has gone stale? And so now it's just, it's just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And they're kind of just doing it to get it done. And it's like they got to scratch an itch or, you know, but there's not really any passion left. I mean, I, you know, my girlfriend that I was talking about, she gave me an experience that was so exotic and so athletic and so primal and so expensive to fix. <laughs> Furniture is not cheap. <laughs> but, but, you know, like that imprinted my mind. Like I, I got to feel the raw power of a woman and it was just like, it, you know, I'm a pretty strong dude and and I had to give it all I had to get that girl. And she would not give it to me easy. But when it happened, it was just wild. I mean, the orgasms and the pleasure and the sense of wow. And just the, the like, we're doing something that's not done very often, but people don't know what they're missing. It's just like, there's such a fullness to an experience like that with your partner, you know, what, 
how do how do you inspire people to get back to life? You get curious and you get playful. That's yeah. what it sounded like to me. That sounded like you guys were hardcore playing like you almost would with a childhood friend, but then you get the added benefit of uh, a delicious sexual experience. And so get curious. I, that's all it took was for me with that, all that initial resistance I felt of like under wanting to, or the shame and the guilt and the fear, or like the banality of life of wanting to explore my body. I, I had to witness that feeling first. But then once I started to, start to get curious, she, the feminine, she just pulls you down this never ending rabbit hole and it's exciting and it's not conquerable. There's no destination. And how much fun is that? You can just keep exploring endlessly. And just when you, like I said, when you think you have one thing figured out, she pulls you in a different direction or she shows you a new uh, desire, a new kink or something you want to have uh, played out. And this is why I love um, working with like female athletes and women who are more in their masculinity because they really get to play with power dynamics in not within just yeah. acquired awareness relationship, but the power dynamics of being in a submissive state, being in a dominant state. And most athletic women or women in their masculine, they want such pure presence. You know, these, these boss babes, these women who are, have been in, had to be in more masculine roles in their life. They want such pure presence from the masculine energy so that they can finally just let go. They can finally just be safe enough to unleash all of themselves. And how exciting is that? So for anyone who's just feels like they're in like this kind of hamster wheel experience, you have a chance to get curious and explore. You've just like scratched the iceberg. There's a whole world you're about to be pulled into. And that starts with you getting curious with your body and playing with your body um, and stumbling into that buried treasure deep between your legs. And you can then bring that in. And I really, Paul, I really believe women are the creatrix and they are the instigators. They are truly like the leaders, the, the leaders that are like co-creating with their partner. And when a woman really starts to own all of that, she is rejuvenated in life. And the inner radiance, I feel like I look younger now at 33 than I did in when I was 27 at the height of my athletic career. And that's all because I'm, I've tapped into my juice and every woman can do that. And then, ex then that is going to just give fuel to the relationship with her partner. And uh, it's like this, we are given this body and given this life, this existence, and it's up to you to get after it. And this is why I love you, Paul, because you're just like, I want to do it all so well. And I want to explore it. I want to express my entire being so that you know, when you take this last breath on this plane, that you did so with dignity, with nourishment, with integrity, and to like, you really just rocked this spirit and you rocked this body. Well, you're bang on. I mean, I, I, it's very important for me to not die having not lived. I think we yes. all come into human form. You know, we're, we're in the middle of these powerful polarities of the masculine and the feminine of expansion and contraction of the anabolic and the catabolic. I mean, you know, this is, these are the forces of nature. These things, these forces create an entire universe and people, um, you know, people live their lives so half cocked all the time that I think that's one of the reasons we have so much depression is because people are so inhibited about really living. And that's why I hate seeing all the, the reality TV shows. I'm like, quit watching television, get out there and do it. You know, if you mm -hmm. want to ride down a, a river on a raft, don't watch it on TV, go get in a raft. <laughs> And, you know, people are so afraid to die. Well, you're already dying by not living. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've always, it's always been important to me to be honest to, with myself and to explore what it is that, that calls to me and interests mm -hmm. me. And, 
um, you know, I, I personally find women to be the most wild, mysterious, powerful, interesting, exciting, dynamic beings um, that I've ever encountered. I think that, you know, I've had the joy of being in relationship and having deep, intimate, intense sexual relationships that literally were like DMT. I mean, it just blew me right the hell out of myself into the universe. And, you know, I, I just feel sad for anybody that hasn't had that, but most of it's their own fault because they just talk themselves out of it or deny themselves or I'll never have that or nobody loves me or whatever. I mean, it's just sad. But when you realize that we are God experiencing itself because God can't know itself until it experiences itself, then we're really doing God's work. We're really doing the exploration of, you know, there's, there's never going to be another Emily Abbott ever again. You're the one and only. God does not do things twice. There will never be your fingerprints again. There will never be your smile, your presence, your uniqueness. And when people realize how the entire universe conspired to create one of them so that God could experience that potential, then once you have that realization, eating junk food, burning yourself out doing a job you don't like and living with someone that you're not in love with is out the window. That's over. Uh, yeah. And I think the feminine, like she'll chew you up and spit you out like she did to me because I wasn't living the life I was supposed to be living and I didn't heed any of her calls. And yeah, so she'll give you a it, disease. <laughs> exactly. And it'll be either, you know, these messages we get in the forms of feathers it, in the forms of bricks and sometimes in the forms of Mack trucks. And it's only yeah. maybe it was at the precipice of my pain of self-sabotaging pain that I decided that, okay, this is time to work on me. And I go all in on me. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did. Um, you're certainly a very interesting podcast and, and, and a very interesting woman. And I'm certainly sure that your partner has his hands very full with you. <laughs> he does. He does. And although he's such, this relationship um, has been such a teacher for me. And I would, would love to just add in like, how can men really, like for your male listeners, how can they, um, what can they do? You know? And so. If, uh, well, that's, me... that's my next question. You know, the, yeah. my, my largest demographic is men 19 to 35 years of age. That makes up the biggest population of my podcast. And, and, you know, I want to make sure that they realize this is a conversation for them. So why don't you share three or four reasons that this information is for them, or maybe whatever rises up in you that you want to say to the young men out there? Because I think, you know, I think we have a problem, especially with young men, not listening or being interested enough in the inner life of a woman and engaging a woman. And I honestly think too, it does take some time for a male to mature yes. past his own childish orientation towards just coming. Yeah. You know, it's just like, it, it, it's, it's really, Johnny Appleseed wants to spread his seed, but it takes a more mature male to want to slow it down, breathe through his nose, and really focus on participating and making sure she gets her needs met and learning how much joy there is in that. And, and so I, I really wanted to have you on not just to talk about what we've talked about, but to inspire the men in the world. So what is your message to the men out there? Well, for the men, like I said, if you want to enter into a truly epic relationship, uh, we have to rewrite the narratives. And that begins individually, of course, um, with each person taking, each a man and a woman taking um, ownership 
for their own sexual energy and learning how to transmute it, how to stoke your own stove, how to move that energy through your body. Um, and the Taoists knew that when they, Taoist sexual practices were that it was tantamount for a woman to have her wildest orgasm, because that's really how he attained life force through her, right? She is that vessel. And so he would make sure that she would feel that expansive pleasure, that amrita and that um, engorgement so that he could also then take that energy and circulate it into himself and then channel it towards what his will on the earth, which is very, very powerful. So for men wanting to learn sexual transmutation and tapping into that power, uh, the Taoist uh, methodologies are, are a great way to go. Yeah, Montauk Chia has a good book on that. Osho yeah. became Osho became famous for his tantric sex approach. I think his first book was on that. So there are yeah. some good books and some good teachings out there. There are. Um but it also begins with men connecting to their feeling state and begin practicing pleasure um energy movement for longer love making. For most women, they need you to slow down and not all women. Sometimes they, you come home and they break you over a coffee table. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, and it's, that's not all the time, right? Sometimes it's, no, that's not all the time, but that is a slowing down. I mean, that, that, that took me two hours at least to, (laughs) to, to get to the orgasm state. So it takes quite a man to go through two hours of full WWF sex to be able to still have enough juice to really get the job done, you know? So, you, you know, that's an exactly. athletic endeavor. It's a sexual athletic endeavor. Totally. Which it's so important to, you know, be in good health like that. Um, but really start with slowing down with your woman. Women are like water. Men are fire. So you need to bring her to a boil. And once you bring her to a boil, she begins to steam. And that is when, you know, um, you again, like Paul said, you look at her eyes, you look at her mouth, you look at her nipples, you look at her body, you really begin to get in tune with speaking the language of her body, speaking pussy, right? Um, and once you understand that, it's really fun energy to play with. So begin learning a woman's sexual anatomy and her pathways of arousal. Learn that language. And ask her, communicate her during your sexual encounters of like, how do you like this? How does this feel? And getting her to start using her voice um, in every sexual experience. And with that, knowing that as you tap into those deeper layers of pleasure, she's going to have emotion come up because she's probably never um, opened her heart truly, not even to herself. So it's really important for men um, to be in that pure masculine uh, energy of witnessing. Um, Tap into holding all of her to let her know that you've got her no matter what. So that deep eye gazing, talking and communicating, like I said, um, that really helps her feel safe to unleash your pure presence, your pure gaze. Women can tell whether they unconsciously know it or not when you're not fully there, just like you can feel when she's not fully there. It's like uh, you. It's a totally different sensation. But when you're both fully, it's an there emptiness. And it's an emptiness. And so, if you want to go deeper with her, uh, get deeper with yourself. Um, and women really want strong men. We are craving it. And the current culture is like this kind of destruction of the purities of masculine and feminine energies. Um, you know, toxic whatever, toxic this, toxic that. Um, they're all distortions, but really a m- woman wants to be held. She wants to be seen and she wants to be heard. It's her responsibility to be able to do that to herself first. But then when she has a man who's willing to step up to her desires that are coming through, that is when magic happens, like volcanic intimacy happens. And when you come up against that tension or resistance between you two, let's say in regular life, get curious, take a deep breath. And know that you have just stumbled upon something that once you bring it to the collaboration table, you're going to be opening up into crazy amounts of fun, of connection, and 
that treasure that you didn't even understand was there. It's just punching through that little paper wall that you've created. And if men want to reach out to me, I have resources um, and books and things they can do to start learning about um, their woman's anatomy of arousal. Yeah, that's great. You know, one thing I'd like to share with the men is, you know, I'm 60 years old now. It's not like I'm 35 anymore. Um, I'm still in good shape, but my second wife, Angie, has a lot of sexual energy. She's an extremely powerful woman. And one of the things I find that's really helped that we, we just, just spirit took us there without, you know, I don't read books about sex. I just be present with my partner. But one of the things that I found is, you know, because I really love her, we look into each other's eyes and I, we rebreathe each other. So she'll breathe a big mm. breath. She'll breathe it into me. I'll bring it into my body, yeah. hold it. I'll breathe it into her. And her life force energy is so powerful that she turns me into a younger man. You know, I, I get so much of, she gives me so much of her chi just through that deep connection and the power of her breath that I, I think that if men would take the time to really deeply connect through the eyes and circulate the breath that yeah whichever one's the strongest their chi will f will pick the other one up i found that to be very very helpful very exciting very erotic it's like yes. sex through the breath and the eyes and it I, I tell you i i've had multiple orgasms just with that alone i didn't even need to wow. be inside her vagina it's just like it's so intensely intimate mm -hmm. that it, it just wow, you're just gone. You just blow up. You know, it's just like, boom, you, you're just there. And, and, and that's before the vaginal part of it even starts sometimes. So totally. Think and then even post, post orgasm, orgasmic states, that's a really important time where you can do that breath, that breathing, that, um, kind of almost a microcosmic orbit between you two. And then that's where I really start to imagine what yeah. I want life to be like, how do I want it to look? That's where my vision comes in. And me and my partner, we both imagine those beautiful visions. And um, that's because you are reordering your, your reality. You are in the space of the beloved, of the God and the goddess. It's so powerful. And it's such a juicy time to just really be still, be quiet, and to just uh, be, into, or, um, be embracing each other. Well, you know, it, it's, um, for me, the, you go from this very high state of erotic excitation, like you say, like a pot boiling and just blowing steam, you know, like the kettle that whistles, you know, but the other side of that is this entry into profound sacred stillness together, where there's just this sense of utter mm -hmm. bliss of satisfaction. And it's can take you as deep as any meditation. You're just there with your partner and you're, you know, from all my practices of Tai Chi meditation and plant medicines, I've, I've entered into utter stillness countless times. And the magical thing about stillness is it's violently explosive. Mm. And when you come to this place of deep stillness, it's almost like letting the gates on a dam go and then life force just pours into you Ugh. and you wake up the next morning and you feel like you can conquer the world, you know, and even yes. if you're lacking sleep, you, you, you know, you might be playing with your partner to two, two, three in the morning, wake up at six thirty after that deep stillness together and feel like you've just been so revived. And, and I think that, these are the kinds of experiences that most people don't realize are just waiting for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love how you describe that. And it's like scheduling time. I know most people are over scheduled and, but schedule this in schedule. Well, I call this that sacred time. I say you got to build yeah. your life around sacred time. 
mm. sacred. What what do I need? How do I need to feed myself? When am I going to exercise myself? Um, when am I going to have sacred time alone with myself? And what's sacred for me and my partner so that we don't lose each other in the yes. you know the ups and downs of life. So I think people have got it backwards. They keep building their whole schedule around stressful things and work, but then they forget the sacred time. So the mm. sacred gets pushed into the background. I tell my clients, look, get, we're going to get out a calendar together. We're going to schedule your sacred time and you're going to build your life around that. Because if you burn yourself out and you get yourself sick, that's a real hard time to find sacred time. Mm -hmm. But if you live your life from the sacred and you know that if you can't meet your needs with the time that's left after you've done your sacred time, it means you need to change your lifestyle because you've made lifestyle choices that are a distraction from living well. Mm. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's just a critical disconnect in our whole culture pretty much around the world now because of all the mechanization, industrialization, and electrification of everything. Oh, I love that because like for me, I knew that when I felt disconnected, like which happens in my life all the time, right? Like um, feeling angry, irritated, uh, frustrated, sad, um, whatever emotion that's coming up, I have devoted sacred time to myself to be able to move that emotion through whatever it is. I'm just holding space for it within my own body through the ritual of my whatever pussy practice um, that is calling to me. I've developed many. And once that is moved, I come into great insight into how sacred I am and into how I want to move with my life. Um, and that is really shown too throughout my whole menstrual cycle. Um, and there's so much power in creating sacred time for yourself. It seems though, when you feel depleted and burnt out, that's the last thing you want to do. Um, you would rather just like veg out and watch a movie or like a bunch of Netflix or like eat a bunch of whatever. But it's when you put into that sacred time, when you put into your body, when you put into your feminine body, she puts back out for you twofold, tenfold. So it's such, um, I understand the resistance for a lot of people to do that. But once you just giving yourself a little bit, a little bit of consistency with that showing up with for yourself, um, it changes the whole game. And women, especially, they often are say like, oh, I'm inconsistent and I don't ever adhere to things. Well, it's like, yeah, you're not a linear being. Like I love men that men can just like constantly like, just like get up every day and work hard. That's amazing. Or, or do what they need to do. But women were so much different. And once I started to really embrace my cyclical fluid nature and how it represents nature itself, I got into such a flow with my body so that it ultimately is always regenerating because I'm not trying to push upstream. I'm flowing with her. Mm. And I want women to know that. I want them to be able to tap in and wake up every morning and and know like, what feeling do I want to create today? How am I going to play with the goddess today? How am I going to play with the feminine today? And it's completely possible. It's completely possible. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure how familiar you are with minerals and trace minerals, but minerals are important to our body for many, many functions. And minerals and trace minerals also help regulate our hormonal system. And one of the products that I've been using for many years is Shilajay Minerals. But when I got a hold of Shervine's Shilajay from Symbiotica, it was a total notch above anything I've ever tried. So I've got Shervine here to tell us what's special about his Shilajay and how to use it. You know, Shilajit is, uh, you can pronounce it any way you want. I like Shilajit. It makes me want to dance a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the actual product makes me want to dance. Good. I take it on the rise you know, it's at the center point of Ayurveda. It's a you know, collection of fulvic minerals, soil, decomposition of plant material. So you're getting all the minerals and it, you're getting it the way Mother Earth provided it and the right. way we can absorb it. And so the way I look at that, it's instant energy and it reduces acidosis across the body. So if you want to reduce and chelate acids out of the body, Shilajit is pretty much the answer and the solution to that. 
And you know, it's probably our best seller right now. Everybody's you know doing rituals with it on the rise, and they're using it throughout the day. It makes for a really good you know tonic. It's delicious. Once your body starts getting acclimated to it, the flavor starts to kick in. And you know, if you're a coffee drinker, if you're a matcha drinker, if you're a tea drinker, this is a really good balancer to keep your body nourished of what you need. Because most people drinking coffee, yes. they're pouring acids and already in it, on, onto an already acidic body. This is a a good way to balance that out through the minerals. And if you're not eating certified organic food from good soils, you're eating mineral deficient food. And the minerals in Sheila J are very important for our skin, our nails, and our hair, which a lot of people have problems with. So I think this is a great product across the board for anybody. And our jing, right? So we are mineral deficient. Yeah. Our foods have been dilapidated, right? It's yes. like Franken foods, right? Shilajit is mineralizing you to the blood, to yeah. the bone. And if you're a man, you're really going to feel it, let me tell you. Yeah, well, good. I'm sure the <laughs> women will like that. So um, get your Jing yes. with your Sheila J. And Jing, you know, that means your, your juice, your life force, boys. And uh, the nice thing about Sheila J is it does not take much at all. No. Uh, a serving is tiny. It's very potent stuff. So it's not like you have to use a lot. It'll last you for quite a while. So go to Symbiotica, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com. And on checkout, to get your 15% discount, use the code CHECK15, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. And remember, check out all their other products because your discount works right across the board. Enjoy. It's amazing to me how many women I've worked with that are so detached from the most important things about themselves. And I think a lot of that comes from the birth control pill. I think it really detaches women from their, from their yes. true uh, feminine essence, the, the cycles mm -hmm. of life, the moon, the water, the rhythms, and they, they, they just become too up in their heads and too out in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been countless women that have come to me with really serious health problems, I track right back to the birth control pill. Yeah. And, you know, would teach them about, um, you know, things like I say, do you, do you pay attention to the, to your vaginal secretions and notice the change as you're in different phases of your cycle so that you know when you're about to be fertile? Um, mm -hmm. Do you pay attention or have you ever monitored your body temperature and correlated that with your ovulation cycle. I would be lucky if one in a hundred women says, oh yes, I'm aware of, you know, my vaginal secretions and when they change and things like that. It's just like they're so detached from their vaginas. It's it's I I I I the more I ran into that, the more shocked I was. It's like, wow, we've got a whole culture for, full of women that have never really learned how to be a woman or how to care for a woman's body. I, I think yeah. that's, I think that's sad, really. It, it's part of the disease of our culture. It's by design. Because if a woman was truly connected, when a woman is truly connected to this space, she doesn't need to get pelvic examinations. She doesn't need to have a doctor tell her how she's going to run her body. And she can then use her sexual energy to be channeled in the direction of her dreams. So it's by design that we're that disconnected from our bodies. And I mean, I, I was just speaking to a university team and a basketball team about simple like cycle syncing and just knowing their vaginas. And most of them don't know where their cervix is. No, most of them don't understand any of the anatomy of their uh, pelvic space. And that's a huge problem. That is a huge problem in our society. And um, when a woman is that disconnected, she's also not apt to uh, make a stand, to use her voice, to uh, really make changes in the world because she is used to deferring to outside sources for her wisdom. But this truly is about through discovering your pl pleasure, you're finding a deeper wisdom. I've read all of the books. I've read all the books. Well, not all of them, but a lot of books on like cycle syncing and women's health and the physiology. But when what really changed the game for me was when I began to tap into my inherent wisdom 
of knowing when do I push? When do I relax? What does my body need? What do I need to ask for in my life? And that's what, what do I need to nourish my body? Like, oh, I'm really craving, like, I know I need some bone broth right now. You know, it's like really tuning, attuning to your inner signals. And that's what athletes, I teach. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what you teach. And I, I guess there's, there's multiple ways to do, to get there. But for women, I think the special journey is understanding this alchemical container of absolute transformation and pleasure right in between your legs, like right in your own body. And when you begin tapping into that regenerative cycle of yourself, you begin to notice that in nature, like I'm growing a big garden out here. And it's just like 10 minutes a day I spend with this garden, and she thrives, you begin to understand, like the ebbs and flows, and trusting the experience of creation itself. And I want women to, when I work with them, I want them to walk away, trusting their experience, trusting their emotions, trusting the heaviness before a flow. And that just being with that is and ritualizing it helps you open up to your wisdom. And that's what I want for any woman that works with me. Yeah. You know, if I was a woman, even if it was by design, I would say, fuck you. I'm redesigning. I don't give a shit what you want. You know, my philosophy is that freedom is really a choice between yes and no, Mm -hmm. and only you can make that choice. And if someone, you know, if I went to church and someone told me I couldn't touch my genitals or whatever, uh, you know, I I never believed any of that crap. Even as a kid, I was smart enough to figure that out. I'm like, yeah, so I end up like a grumpy ass like you all day. Right. (laughs) I'll pass. You you know, uh, I, I, I. I highly doubt Jesus had all these hangups, but oh, uh, I know. And that's why I tell women too, like who have been more in the Judeo Christian like realms to read the Mag- Magdalene manuscripts to yes. understand the true relationship between uh, Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene and the um, sex magic of ISIS. Mm-hmm. It's mind blowing that they were showing us that through sexual, pure sexual love, and the masculine and feminine play, orgasmic dance, you can strengthen the ka body or the energetic body. And then once you have a really strong energetic body, there is no death anymore because you leave this form and transition in your energetic body to walk through the realm of death. So this is like, I could get very esoteric with the importance of sexuality and why modern religion or Christianity in particular destroyed the feminine. You know, it's became the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But where's, yeah, I know. Where's the, I think that's where's the feminine in that? You know, and really, yeah. that's a denial of Earth. It's a denial of the woman's body. It was dirty. It was profane. And to get to the heavenly realms, you just better stay away from that. But to get to the heavenly realms, one must first go through the body, the gift that you've been given. So this is a big, big work and it's, uh, but it can be really fun. It doesn't have to be super heavy. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, when people start giving me all this religious silliness, I just look right in their eyes and say, I have one question for you. How is that working for you so far? <laughs> Are you happy? Are you healthy? Are you whole? Well, I already know the answer because you're in my office paying me a large sum of money every hour to help you figure out why you're not enjoying your life and why your body's breaking down. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just agree to stop playing games that are destroying the entire culture of humanity worldwide and have your own relationship with God instead of reading some book written by some sexually frustrated priest? (laughs) And um, the other thing is that women are inherently medicinal. Like we bleed from the center of our bodies every month. And what I, I, it's funny when I work with women is I encourage them to create these rituals around their uh, cycles. And when they start to do that, they start to tap into a witchiness that they're afraid of because probably someone in their lineage was burned for being too witchy. 
to pay yeah. to part of the earth. But that is your birthright. Your birthright is to have incredible pleasure. Your birthright is to be completely connected to this experience that we're in and completely connected to your body. So it's really parsing out these, uh, this very deeply interwoven shame and guilt tools um, that are held over us. And pleasure is the antidote for that. Well, here's a paradox. If more people lived like we're describing right now, do you realize that the lockdowns and COVID would have been a sexual feast and people would have been giggling and laughing and the world would be a better place? But instead, we got suicide, drug addiction, obesity, fear, PTSD. All of that could have been circumvented by using that time to sing, to dance to make love, to paint, to, to grow food, to grow food, to have fun with your kids and to meditate on how we're going to handle the fact that the leaders of our world are psychologically damaged and need a lot of empathy, compassion and serious help. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I have uh -huh. one more question before we wrap up and I want to ask you about your new course. Uh, but the question I have is, what are your feelings around having sex with more than one person at a time? And mm. do you feel that detracts from the intimacy and the orgasmic potential or the spiritual depth? Or do you feel that it can actually add to the di another dimension to it? This is such an interesting question and one that um, as I fall deeper into the feminine um, and touching on all the desires that uh, I possibly have had in my life, and we don't know where desire comes from, right? Desire is just there and we can't explain it. Um, so for me... Um, I know right where it I'm comes from. Where? You really want to know? <laughs> yeah. Well, by definition, God is that for which there is no other. You understand that? God yeah. is that for which there is no other. God can't be God if there's another God. Mm -hmm. There's nothing outside of God. So the reason you're here, Emily, and the reason I'm here is because God is so desperately alone that God had to look into itself to create love, and that's the origin of desire. Hmm. Desire is the deep desire to make love and have companionship. And it is because God is alone that God has the desire to explore itself. And in that process, it dreams up companions to have the experience of what it truly is. And it is the fact that a woman's womb is empty and a man's penis is full that increases the desire in her because she actually is more of a replica of the emptiness of God itself. Mm. Damn. <laughs> wow, Paul. Um, I'm just going to sit with that for a second. So I've been, within I've, been, I've been so deep into God that the loneliness almost broke me in half. I realized mm. why God creates all that is. It's really God is the, the vastness, the emptiness, and the magnitude of God is so almost inconceivable for the human mind that if you took your deepest most painful hunger and multiplied it by infinity you would know what it feels like to be god and a woman is a much closer she's got a much closer experience to the emptiness because She's not really full until she has life in her womb. 
And that is exactly what God did. And this is why Tantra is so beautiful, because Shakti, in her emptiness, looked into herself to manifest her lover, Shiva, her husband, her consort, her child. She filled herself with Shiva, which is the source of the created universe. So mm. if you look into God's vagina, you see the universe, but that's there because that shows you the depth of God's desire for love. Oh, that's beautiful. And I that's what I know to sometimes. be true. Of course you yes, do. Yes, because it's like this, sometimes I'm so overcome with such a deep yearning and I don't know what it is, but it's so palpable. And I'm learning now to just yearn, to feel all of that. Mm -hmm. And it, to be a woman is to be, it's so it's such a gnarly experience. And um, so now I'm really learning in, within regards to this like previous question is what desire, because I have a million desires, right? It's infinite because God is infinite. So if I'm a conduit for that love, for God's love and for all of that which God desires, it's learning with discernment and like with my freedom of choice, what desire will bring me nourishment and dignity? And how does that want, how does that look? And however that looks, as long as it's attuned to my dignity, to my, with integrity and to uh, nourishment, then that's is what it will be. So mm -hmm. I can't say every human is so different, right? And we all have a different spiritual path. But um, so whatever, if you can slow down enough to understand what desire must be brought into the 3D world, like must be culminated from the feminine, which is just the de endless desire, and then bringing it through into the culmination or fulfillment of that desire, which is the masculine, because we live in a feminine consciousness and we, but we are in a masculinized um, world. Whatever is brought through with that intention and with slowness, I think then is the right thing for that person. And I don't know where this journey is going to take me, but I just know that I'm so up for it. And that's the way, that's the song of my life. That's a prayer of my life is to live in that way. And what I find a lot of times though, especially with our over-sexualized culture, but hyper um, disconnected culture, we often get influenced in ways that we think this is the right thing for us, but we don't truly know uh, if that is the right thing for us. And so that's where maybe you can see um, feminine desire can be so boundless and that it could just be this continual like orgy, endless orgy, but would that be nourishing? Because all I want in my sexual experiences is finding more of me, finding more of God. And to do that with another is this co-creational like um, speed strip to God. So I don't know what the right answer is. All I know is that I'm learning how to discern what wants to channel through me. I think that's a good answer. That. That's an honest answer. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it's been a matter of exploration and following my curiosity. You know, my, my rule, as long as you're not doing any harm to anybody and or being disrespectful or breaking agreements, then explore or you'll never know you know joseph campbell says the cave you fear to enter has the treasure you need the most and i think the depth mm. of the wisdom in there takes a, a joseph campbell to to utter and um, right. you know i'm curious so though I, about the agreements though that's what i'm curious about agreements that we all make uh in which regard do we make them like it's within those agreements that that is where power dynamics are expressed between two partners or between a society, between uh, freedom and non-freedom. It's like these unspoken agreements. So that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, unspoken agreements are often dirty, though, or they would be on the table. Right. 
And, you know, when people have control power dynamics, um, they, they use uh, unspoken agreements and leverage and shame and guilt. Um, but, you know, when I'm talking about the opportunity to explore sex with, you know, two guys with a girl or two, two women with a man or whatever the combination thereof, mm-hmm. I, I think that, that, you know, my rule is none of us can be doing this by breaking an agreement with somebody we already have a relationship with. Like yeah. if you're married and you're doing this and your husband doesn't know, then you're, you're going to bring that energy into the experience and it's not going to be what it, could be if it was sacred, you know, I, I think. Mm. I so think, what makes it sacred? Yeah. It has to be based in love and honesty and, and, uh, agreements between each of you that this is, um, an expression of love, regardless of what somebody else might call it. If it's love for everybody involved and it's treated like love and respected like love, then it is love. But if it's pornography, then it's pornography. If it's, if it's escaping the fact that you aren't yes. able to deal with your own relationship, so you have to get kinky sex somewhere else and keep that under the table, then it always comes back to bite you. And, and I, you know, I don't agree. I don't believe in participating in that kind of a sexual relationship because I, I have to sleep with myself. I have to maintain my own integrity. And, um, so I, I think, you know, these are explorations that we all have the opportunity to grow into, but, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. If you, if, if you have integrity in your life, it'll, it'll be in your sex life as well. It'll be in your professional work. It'll be in your art. It'll be in your parenting. It'll be in your management of finances. But if we have a lack of integrity in other areas, it'll show up in the bedroom as well. And then that leads to, um, instead of a bonding effect, it relate, relate, it, it causes an erosion of a relationship. Totally. And I think I love that you brought up escapism because I think often we, and I find myself, I can find myself slipping into desires when it becomes just like more, give me more, more, more. Um, that's the realm of those the hungry ghost, right? It's not truly fulfilling. It's just um, it's empty um, on the other side, and so that's why, like, when I really speak to like that nourishment and like dignity, like something I can sign my name to when I die, or like the life that's that it. I've signed up for, right? That's it. That that's right? the essence of it. Yeah. Who wants to sign their name to to lying, to cheating, and to keeping shit in the closet? I mean, right. nobody wants their name on that painting. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, you know, make your love life something you can sign your name to. You know, if I was to be burned at the stake by Christians for having sex with the women that I've had or having <laughs> two women in bed with me, I would say light me the fuck on fire because guess <laughs> what? I'm going home. You're the one that has to stay here with yourself. Oh, that's why I love you, Paul. I don't. It's I don't. Larger, you know, it's that larger than life attitude, you know. People invest so much time in energizing what they don't want, while yeah. at the same time secretly wishing they had everything of the, the, the that the people have that they're burning and criticizing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's like, give me a break. It's time to stop being children in adult bodies. Yeah. I, Start practicing well, real religion. You know, Rumi says only a heretic can get to God. Why? Because you don't get to God reading books about other people's rules, regulations, and experiences. You get to God through your art, through your vagina, through your penis, through your children, through your work, through community, through helping people, you know, People keep looking for God out there. I'm like, I got news for you. This is God. Yes. Welcome to I'm- God. Wake up and look around. <laughs> you know, you're you're looking yes. for God and you don't realize you're you're sleeping with God. You're combing God's hair, not in my case, but you're, you know, you're brushing God's teeth. You're petting God when you touch your dog. 
you know, religion has done such a destructive thing by putting God in some invisible realm and creating a heaven that's not here. Yeah. What what a crooked, what a crooked trick. Right. But this is what's so cool because, you know, Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ, like we are in the end times of this way of being, this paradigm. Thank God. I think, I think that what is interesting though, is that Rumi also said like, my days are of our, I'm going to butcher it, but it's like, my days are of hellfire and pain when I'm reaching and grasping outside of myself. And I think that's where the balance comes in with desire, because I know for myself, like it's been a, a journey of once I'm tapping into desire, it's just like, Oh my God, like I want it all to come through and I want it to happen now. But it's really, and for a lot of women, because they haven't been honest about their truest, deepest desires, it can come out really, like we talk about sideways, self-sabotaging or like really like weird distortions. So once you get into, and this is like a deeper layer, once you get past all the conditioning and you start to really experience great pleasure, and then you call in someone in your life that is is a champion and really uh, elevating you you are in this place of incredible power. And with that becomes, comes so much responsibility because it can go, the feminine, as we know, can go haywire, right? We, it can be destructive. And so it's really important that um, a, a, a lot of women are so scared to d- get into it because they're, when they have explored their wildest femininity, it's gone poorly or it's been received poorly. And so they have that ingrained in, uh, you know, their bodies and they have to understand that this is not that, that this exploration is being also bolstered and supported with a really healthy, strong, masculine presence inside of you, um, to help guide and be the riverbed for all that feminine energy. Yeah. Emily, it's been a absolutely honest, loving, beautiful conversation and i really hope that people gain a lot of inspiration from what you've shared and from your life path um i know you're about to release a new course which i think is really important for women to know about so can you take two or three minutes and just give us an overview and let people know how to go ahead and access that course and and what their investment in themselves is sure Uh, My course is coming out mid-September, and it's called Hammer of the Goddess, A Return to Epic Womanhood. And this course is for the woman that, in the pursuit of her freedom and influence, suppressed or denied her femininity. And through my three-month experiential immersion, each woman will learn how to take care of the structural, physiological, emotional, and and spiritual elements of her female form. She'll learn how to drop into the wisdom of her body, her emotions, sensations, and her energetic flows between the masculine and feminine channels inside of her. I truly believe, Paul, that when a woman lives a life from pussy, from pleasure and feminine embodiment, she will discover how to attune to what she really wants and how to magnetize those those desires for her with unshakable confidence. She'll learn that she does not need to perform for anyone. She'll learn to live in authentic, full expression of herself and how to feed the flames of her desires. I want every woman who does this course to discover her grand vision, the prayer for her life within her pelvic bowl to unblock the channel of life force carrying her on the chariot of her destiny. And I stand for the power of men. I stand for the power of women. And this course is to return to epic womanhood by rewriting the narrative of womanhood in her body, in her mind, in her spirit, and back to the seat of her throne. And this is how we move humanity forward. This is how we level up. And it's done (laughs) with so much joy and pleasure. And so they can find this course on my website at uh, emily-abbott.com. You can find me on Instagram uh, at emilyannabbott. And this investment in themselves will be $2,222. And with the Paul check code, they will get $200 off um, with the use of that code.
And what's the code? Paul Check 200. And your last name is spelled A B B O T, correct? Two T's, two B's. Okay, A B B O T T. So Emily A B B O T T. Yeah. Good. Um, mm -hmm. Very important because, you know, URLs, if you get one letter wrong, it's not going to get there. Yeah. Fantastic. And I'm, yeah. Wow. And I'm based here. I'm based here in San Diego. I do also um, online uh, coaching with women uh, as well as uh, in personal or in person work, um, hands on, hands on, hands in work. So it's uh, an amazing journey. And I love sharing what I know with women. It's an absolute honor. Well, awesome. Thank you, Emily. What a fantastic journey we've just gone on together. Mm -hmm. We've covered everything from God to sex to life to schedules to shadow work to honesty to religion to freedom. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it could be more full. I'd like to just close by saying thank you to my sponsors for all your love, your support, your excellent products, and your sustainable practices, and your concern for and empathy and compassion for people in the world. And thank you to all my listeners for sharing the podcasts and for sticking with me and learning and growing with me and Emily and all my guests and helping make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future. We are safe. Mm -hmm. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. Big hug, Emily. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Emily Abbott. You can find Emily online at emily-abbott.com. That's E-M-I-L-Y-A-B-B-O-T-T.com, where you can learn more about her courses, one-on-one -on -one work, and browse the psychedelic gypsy pleasure treasure chest. Follow her on Instagram at emily.ann.abbott for up-to-the-minute posts and news. Emily is offering Paul's listeners $222 off her brand new course, Hammer of the Goddess. Find out more at emily-abbott.com forward slash hammer dash of dash the dash goddess or complete the application form online at bit.ly forward slash blisswoman. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash blisswoman. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.